Good morning. Uh, nobody wants to come up front? I can tell the librarians are over here, right? Are those the librarians? Yeah. All right. uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the speaker for today. I, I thank you for showing up today. Uh, I'm sure that all of you were safe getting here because of the rain. Uh, but Todd McLeese is a thought leader in artificial intelligence and its influence on work and learning. His frameworks are pivotal in helping organizations across various industries and academic institutions build their AI agility and cultivate a skill and adaptive global workforce. Todd's influence in the education sector is extended through his partnership with more than 40 institutions of higher education. And it was my privilege to attend one of those sessions uh, at LC on January the 8th, so that's how I know about Todd. As a co-founder and board member of the London-based Human Skills Project, Todd is deeply committed to advancing the integration of uniquely human skills within the fast-paced world of digital technology. He serves on the advisory council of CAEL, the Council of Adult and Experiential, Exper Experiential Learning, and is a founding board member of HERA, the Higher Educational Regional Alliance, which includes all 17 of the higher eds in southeastern Wisconsin. We got background music. He was recognized by Lincoln as the top voice on artificial intelligence for 2023 and 2024 and is a contributor to the Harvard Business Review. Todd offers insightful forward-thinking perspectives to a global audience on human flourishing in the age of AI. I know we had some uh, concerns about AI in the past when it started flourishing in our district. So his current work in Texas includes partnerships with Amarillo College, Texas Tech University, Laredo College, Alvin Col Community College, San Jacinto College, as well as a career academy within the Amarillo Independent School District. He's also keynoting the Board of Trustees Institute Conference for TACC in Austin for the second time in four months. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Todd McLeese, a distinguished individual whose expertise and passion I experienced for, firsthand on January the 8th during the Laredo College Leadership Training. As a representative of United ISD, we are honored to have him provide insight into his remarkable contributions and achievements related to AI. Todd embodies the values and principles that define United ISD's commitment to educational excellence and equity. His contributions to the field have not only shaped educational discourse, but also inspired countless educators, administrators, and stakeholders to embrace change, challenge conventions, and strive for excellence. As United ISD continues its mission to empower students and cultivate lifelong learners, we are confident that Todd McLeese expertise, vision, and passion will be invaluable assets in advancing our shared goals and aspirations. Please join us in extending a warm welcome to Todd McLeese as we embark on this journey together, united in our commitment to educational excellence and student success. Thank, Thank you, you, Mario. Good morning. Now I know why all the students sit in the back of the class. Uh, um, I thought librarians were quiet people, no? Um, how many of you consider yourself to be technical? Okay. Today it doesn't matter. What you're going to find with the tools that we'll work through this afternoon and, or maybe later this morning, um, and what we'll talk about throughout the day is that you don't have to be technical in order for these solutions to be accessible to you. How many of you have used a tool like ChatGPT or ChatGPT itself? And how many of you use it regularly today? OK, great. So I always like to understand who we're talking to. Um, I thought I'd get the scary stuff out of the way first. And change is scary, right? Um, what we're expecting with regard to emerging technologies, not just AI, is that over the next decade, there will be as much change as we've experienced in our lifetimes, in our parents' lifetimes, and maybe their parents' lifetimes, in the, 
in the last 100 years. And what that has to do with primarily is the convergence of these technologies. You can see throughout time with the steam engine, um, there's a boost in productivity, and then the railroad, which was enabled was by the steam engine, and so forth. So when you have transportation, ways that we connect, different technologies, different processes are created, and so forth, um, productivity increases, economic productivity. And that hasn't been the case for the last 50 years or so. It's pretty flat in the last uh, 50 years, leading up to about 2007, where you start to see some pretty good jumps. But now what we're expecting to see in this decade is that far right of the graph. And it has to do with all of those technologies really finding their place in society widely at the same time, and many of them feeding off of one another. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but we're going to spend very little time on the technical today. I, tend to focus on the impact of technology as it relates to people. When you think about the 28 technologies and the 14 processes that represent paradigm shifts throughout all of history, it's these 42. In your lifetime, what would you say is the most profound invention or technology that has occurred? Internet? Smartphone, anybody, right? And so in the next, in this decade, in the bottom there, you see these technologies that are occurring with Apple Vision Pro, with spatial computing, with uh, MetaQuest, the virtual reality. So anything uh, augmented reality, virtual reality is called extended reality. You can see some crowns next to those technologies. And those six technologies are called the Kingmaker technologies or given the audience the queen maker technologies today. And um, the reason for that is because they're so incredibly powerful just on their own. And the countries and the organizations that control those technologies will be like kings of the past. So when you think of the most profound technologies ever, what the technology leaders talk about, like Sundar Pichai from Google, is that there are really only three techno two other technologies that compare to artificial intelligence. Electricity, at the beginning of the previous century, it enabled lots of productivity in terms of appliances. But it wasn't just electricity. It was electricity, the telephone, and the gas combustion engine all sort of happened at the same time. So we had power, energy, we had uh, a shift in transportation, and we had a shift in the way we connect people with the telephone. AI is compared to that time. We've never lived through that type of productivity in our lifetimes. The only other one that it's compared to is the discovery of the control of fire. And so it leads technology leaders like Sundar Pichai to say it's the most profound technology ever, certainly in our lifetimes. But what makes technology profound is not the technology itself or the discovery itself or the process itself. It's the impact that it has on people. And so when we discovered fire or the control of fire, uh, either 300,000 years ago or 1.7 million years ago, depending on what you read. Um, it changed everything because it allowed us to cook food. Our brains began to grow in size. We had greater mental capacity because of that, cognitive capacity. Um, we started to form communities called tribes. It extended our days into evenings because we could walk down those pathways with torches it really led to this element of human flourishing. By the way, every image that you see in my presentation today, maybe not the graphics, the graphs, but every image is AI, was produced with AI, okay? Because um, they probably weren't writing human flourishing on the side of a cave uh, back then. But in the second industrial revolution, it was the same. I mentioned, the gas combustion engine led to the automobile. Electrification changed everything at the factory level. 
uh, the telephone connected people. And it really was about human flourishing. It was a time where we created the middle class. We created mass production. The scientific theory of management happened at the same time. And so it's really about our response. In recent years, we've gotten our response wrong. Um, we left it alone with social media, for instance. Um, there's all sorts of data now about just how damaging some of that can be. So this is not about technology, the age of AI. It's really about our response. It's about who we are and who we aspire to be. It's about the opportunity to help people flourish. And it's most comparable to the mid-15th century and the invention of the printing press, Gutenberg, who was just a Bible salesman who wanted to sell more books. And so he created the press. And what happened because of that was essentially le leading to the democratization of knowledge and education and so forth, the Italian Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment, Reformation, maybe not in that order. But it, again, was about flourishing. And that's the opportunity that artificial intelligence brings us. And it's the human response that we have to aim for, not the response that was uh, the 50-year-old response around when the PC started to make its way in, in deeper into society in 1974 or so. All of that productivity increase, which was incremental, about 1% per year, went to the employer. We, the way we changed work patterns, um, our, our lack of response to social media before it was too late, leaving things in the hands of the technologists and the users of that technology, it can't be about that. It has to come down to, like it used to, the educators, to help people understand the way to leverage the technology so that they can live up and see more in themselves and realize their full human potential. And that has challenges, right? Because not everybody wants to live up to their full human potential as work changes. So today we're going to talk about um, a little bit of the landscape of AI, and then we're going to talk about what's going on in terms of the world of work, and then we're, we'll talk about some of the opportunities we have to play a part in that. But instead of me talking about AI, uh, I thought I would have AI do it. OK, go ahead. Well, I hope it works. Before we dive in, let me ask you a quick question. Does anybody know the significance of the summer of 1956 in the world of artificial intelligence? That's right. It was the summer when the Dartmouth workshop took place, marking the birth of artificial intelligence as a field of study. This was the moment when the term artificial intelligence was coined and the foundations for future AI research were laid. Antes de comenzar, permítame hacerles una pregunta rápida. ¿Alguien sabe la importancia del verano de 1956 en el mundo de la inteligencia artificial? ¿Todo alguien ha respondido a la pregunta? Así es, fue el verano en que tuvo lugar el taller de Dartmouth, marcando el nacimiento de la inteligencia artificial como campo de estudio. Fue en ese momento cuando se acuñó el término inteligencia artificial y se sentaron las bases para la futura investigación en IA. Avanzando hasta hoy, estamos viendo el impacto increíble de la IA generativa como yo mismo en la educación, la creatividad y más allá. Es un momento emocionante para explorar las posibilidades de la IA y estoy emocionado de ser parte de su viaje. How is her Spanish? Yeah. It's the English teachers, the dual language teachers, the humanities teachers that are going to rule this time in terms of how you use this technology. This is very much about how you talk to one another, how we, how we collaborate as human beings. That's how you work with this technology, and you'll find some out, something out about that this uh, as we get into the workshops. 
just want to share with you this one framework from Gartner about tech. Um, this is their, it's called the hype cycle. They have these wonderful terms like the peak of uh, inflated expectations followed by the trough of disillusionment, okay? AI, this is all the different AI technologies. The business value and the value for you and the users is on this slope, the slope of enlightenment. And once it gets to the plateau of productivity, it's widely adopted. Right now, generative AI, what we're talking about today, is at peak hype. And ultimately, during this year, most likely, it will fall into the trough of disillusionment. The reason it will do that is because of the paradoxes that exist around AI, and I want to talk about those so that we, it's not complete uh, blind utopian optimism. Uh, there's a balance here, and it's what we have to proactively manage. I do want to reframe what you see on the screen right now. Instead of thinking about this in terms of artificial intelligence, because we know that, at least for the moment, there is no consciousness in AI, right? Let's think about AI as how we use technology to augment human capabilities, to augment our intelligence and many other things. I use AI tools every day, uh, sometimes all day, every day. And I want to show some of those to you today, but we'll focus on ChatGPT for the exercises. But let's talk about these paradoxes. Um, there are big picture paradoxes. Let me ask, as an educator, what's your number one fear about ChatGPT? Somebody say cheating? Shout, shout the answers out, please, louder. Plagiarism, Plagiarism cheating. Replacing teachers. Replacing teachers. Okay, the only one, uh, so there's no question people are going to misuse this tool. I want to help you understand how we can teach people to use the tool um, in the right way. And of course, they still won't all do that. But there are incredibly powerful ways to shape our assignments so that, for instance, I know college professors and high school teachers that are encouraging or requiring the use of something like ChatGPT, but they have to show the teacher their critical thinking process, show them all of the prompts that they used to get the result. So if you type six words in saying, write me a book summary about title of book, that's not a passing grade. But if you work through and iterate in a sort of human-centered design, from a human-centered design perspective, it actually increases critical thinking. I don't believe teachers are at risk. I think your jobs will change significantly. Um, since last March, uh, there, I've got some data on that that I'll show you. But let's talk about the really big issues. Because some people believe that, in fact, 50% of AI researchers, so the experts, believe that there's a greater than 10% chance that, it, that this technology will lead to human extinction. Okay? So the profound issues on the negative side, of fundamental challenges, are much larger than plagiarism and cheating and so forth. I believe the tool can be used to increase human skills like critical thinking, the high cognitive skills, and the socio-emotional skills. Um, and I, again, I've used the tool every day, tools, multiple tools every day. What we have to do is help people understand how to do that and why they should do it. I have a 13-year-old, somehow, and um, she studies, well, I know how, but... Um, <laughs> She doesn't, is not, it's banned by the school district. She's not allowed to use it. She doesn't use it. We don't allow her to use ChatGPT. She has a paid subscription um, for papers and assignments, but she can use it to study. So she recently had a social studies exam, eighth grader, um, on U.S.-Cuban relations. 
And much like ChatGPT just talked about the summer of 1956, it actually quizzed her 10 questions each night. She was allowed to bring a study guide into the exam. And it would fill in the gaps for her when she didn't have a complete answer. So it was essentially three nights of 15 minutes of oral exam to say, how prepared are you for this? And oh, that's almost a whole answer, but here are a couple of things you might consider. So now she's getting context. It's meeting her where she is, and she's able to take those things that it pointed out and put that on her study guide instead of the things that she actually knows, for instance. right? So there's really positive and proactive ways to use this. But as you look at this board, there's tremendous potential and tremendous risk as it relates to AI. And I, I, I really believe that educators are the only people who can help the users, because we know student, your students are using it, right? We know they are. I want to think about academic integrity and building that rather than academic dishonesty and trying to catch somebody. We want to build academic and professional integrity in people. And it has to come from the educators. And in order to do that, you need to understand how some of these tools work. And not just the tools, not just in terms of how do I use this to get a result. Because I'm going to show you all of that today, and you'll have a PDF of a, a I call it an empowered user guide. Um, and that's not the hard part. The hard part is having the discipline to use it in the right way so that you're not outsourcing human capability to the AI, which is a message I consistently share with our 13-year-old, which is every time you do that, you're making yourself less necessary and you are causing cognitive atrophy as it relates to critical thinking and other high cognitive skills. And so there's significant risk in just doing that. Now, of course, I use it to just sit down and say, I need an email, and here's what has to be in that email, and it knocks out a first draft for me, of course. And that's what Microsoft Copilot is all about, for instance, in enterprise right now, is just saving time in coding, doing emails. Doing, it'll do an entire PowerPoint presentation for you in no time. But there's risk here in terms of professionals as well. We have to learn how to use these tools and why to use the tools to build our capabilities instead of outsource those capabilities. And, and that's what our workshops are about today. On the user side, I have experienced every one of these pitfalls. I just want to share one with you. Over the past year plus that I've been using the tool every day. So I, I don't have a good reason for this. I know I'm. I'm going to die a decade earlier, but I wake up at 2 o'clock every morning, and I work until 4 a.m., and then I go back to sleep. Okay? I've done that since I moved home from London, and I could certainly have changed that over the last 17 years, so it's a really poor excuse. But one night, and, and it's typically a very productive time for me. Right? I did it this morning in preparation for today. Just, it's, a, it's a really good focused time for me. One morning, I woke up in an Amarillo hotel, and I was, uh, I, I knew that I needed to get something done for a client that was due in a couple of days, and I wanted to just get it done. And I woke up with that intention, and I got my laptop out with that intention. And then an hour and 45 minutes later, I went to sleep after writing two children's books. And that was not the deliverable. <laughs> now, I won't take you through why that all happened, but I went down this rabbit hole, and here's why I think it happens. I got distracted by a single word. It led me to think about other things, and then it ended up with me creating Pixar characters of critical thinking, looked a lot like Einstein, and um, uh, writing these stories to explain to children the importance of critical thinking. So it felt like I was being really productive, even though it wasn't the thing I was going to do. Now, both the stories are awful, and they'll never see the light of day. Um, it'll never be in the library. Um, but it was not what I intended to do when I woke up to get work done, right? 
And that day, I had a couple of meetings, and one of them was with this gentleman who, um, he, was, he had been a working artist for 10 years during his career. And he explained to me that what I was talking about was managing creative energy. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm sure many of us have read stories or studies or whatever the case may be about the dopamine burst you get from a, a Facebook like and the neurochemicals involved in social media, right, serotonin and the stress, the cortisol, etc. I believe the, cre the ability to create, the democratization of creation is stronger. It's more addicting than Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. YouTube Reels. I think the draw is bigger for people who like to achieve things anyway. And it has risk associated with it. So the other challenge is you can go very quickly and not have the expertise but think that you do. And there's some data about that. Um, in a controlled group of around 1,500 professionals, consultants from Boston Consulting Group, one of the world's largest consulting firms, they did 18 tasks. And when they were working on something that AI was good at, and that changes every day. Yesterday was a huge day in AI. I'll show you a couple of those examples that happened yes just yesterday. It happens every week or two weeks. There's a 40% uplift in quality of work versus those that don't use ChatGPT. But if you're working on tasks that it's not good at, and there's no way of knowing until you try, because there's no manual, it's a 23% deficit in quality of work. The next piece is around uh, productivity. And I mentioned that infinite exploratory loop or that you know, distraction, the digital distraction of, of creativity, and then decision making. So in that same study, what they found is the consultants that were given um, ChatGPT to work with, they finished tasks 12% faster. They finished 25% more tasks because if you can finish things faster, there's some motivation built in. And again, the quality was 40% higher. I think we're going to, well, I don't know what's going on with this. I'm just going to drive from over here for a second. Um, I think we're going to fundamentally change the way we make decisions this year. Here's why. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, has anybody heard that name before? Or, or thinking fast and slow? So Kahneman was an Israeli-born psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in 1979, or for his 1979 study around prospect theory. Have you heard the term cognitive bias? He coined that term in his research, right? And he talks about system one and system two for decision making. And about 90, depending on your role and who you are, about 90% of the time during the day, we just use intuition and heuristics and experiences and we just make decisions, right? Because we make lots of decisions all day long and we just do that. And then. 5 to 10 or 15% of the time, if you're in a decision-making role, you have to think about the decision and leverage critical thinking. I think going forward, there's, and so that's fast and slow over on the left, critical thinking. And then going forward, because we are far more connected than ever, so that, that study was in 1979. In 1983, there were around 83, uh, 513 devices connected to the internet, and today there are more than 20 billion. Okay, so our level of connectivity, like the telephone connected us, is much greater than anybody thought possible 50 years ago. And so collaborative decision making is system three, and system four is decision making augmented by AI. I was listening to a podcast the other day, it was Bill Gates' podcast, called Unconfuse Me, with Sam Altman, the founder of OpenAI, who they created ChatGPT. And they talked about two forms of AI that will hit this year in the new model of ChatGPT. 
It's called causal AI, so cause and effect, and neuromorphic AI, which has to do with reasoning the way the human brain reasons. So when you have cause and effect and you have reasoning built into the AI, in addition to any material, any content ever produced that's publicly available, it's going to be able to make decisions much faster and probably better than human beings. But probably better, <laughs> right? And so it will still certainly require human oversight. It's called human in the loop. And depending on the importance or the criticality, the level of criticality of that decision, it will still be very much a human task. But I really f have a fear that many decision makers won't know if it's their call or the AI's call. But nobody's going to hold the AI accountable, right? It's still going to be the person for the foreseeable future. And so that's coming this year in terms of decision making as we know it. And then there's this piece around global connectivity, like I just talked about all the connected devices. AI, because it, like you said, it has pretty good Spanish. It also has pretty good almost every other language. Um, so it can help connect us and break down language barriers and so forth. It can also cause us to isolate. And I have found over the past year that at times I rationalize it by saying, oh, I'm just heads down working on this but I'm more isolated than I used to be at times in terms of just getting work done. It's less collaborative for me. I collaborate with the AI. It's not the movie Her, um, but it's close because in the car, I don't listen to podcasts or books anymore. Auto, on Audible, I build frameworks with the AI over speaker, right? And so we had a wonderful conversation on the way down from San Antonio last night. Um, so that causes the less of a need. And again, I want to point back to that feeling that you get that in like 15 minutes, you knock out an entire framework. Like the one on the previous slide, I built that in, last night on the way down here. So. Then there's the accelerated digital divide. I'm involved in lots of opportunities with um, uh, traditionally underserved communities. I have a huge fear that it's, this is not a cost issue anymore. This technology is far less, getting far less expensive at a much faster rate than computing power. So computing power, Moore's Law, every 18 to 24 months, doubles in power, halves in cost. AI is 20 times faster than Moore's Law currently and accelerating. So it, it is de being demonetized essentially and it's not an issue of accessibility to the technology because it's, it can be free on a browser, right? From either Google or Microsoft, etc. Now it may not be their most powerful model but in a very short period of time, their less powerful model will be their formerly most powerful model. And that's really good model. It's incredible what it's capable of. Absolutely incredible. And it's free. So what is the barrier? Learning how to use it properly from a human first perspective. And if we don't teach them, young and old, they will just continue to write eight word prompts and get their papers knocked out and so forth. But instead, we can use it to help them build their human skills. So individual performance, but collective creativity goes away. This is the isolation issue. This is a great field leveling technology. If I'm a bottom half performer at baseline, the positive impact on my work is 43%. If I'm in the top half, it's 17%. Here's what that looks like when compared. It closes the gap. Bottom half versus top half. 
if you look at on the right, that 40% increase actually surpasses the upper level increase. And that's the people who are using ChatGPT, not the people who didn't, where they're still at their baseline. So it has an incredible opportunity to help people. And then there's this last piece around collaborative creativity, um, oh, sorry, stifling creativity over time. 70% of users are saying that over time they think they'll become less creative. We have to guard against that. We have to put systems and processes in place and reasons why people want to protect that. They need to know about these issues. It can't just be, hey, I caught you cheating. You uh, leveraged this to turn in a book summary or a paper or research. You cited a source that doesn't exist because the AI hallucinated, etc. It has to be more constructive because, as we all know, High school students, college students, professionals, young children, etc. we spend so much energy trying to work the system, right? The difference here is uh, when I was in high school, there was this thing called Cliff Notes, right? I think it's Spark Notes now. Cliff Notes couldn't help me. AI can help me. So it's not... They're not equivalent. It's not the same as plagiarism because it, the technology actually has a tremendous upside in terms of realizing my potential. Okay, kind of keeps going forward by two clicks instead of one, but um, that's okay. This is a really important slide. Nothing else needs to be invented. What I just talked about will come out this year. That doesn't matter for this part. In 2017, McKinsey and Company, the, one of the largest consulting firms in the world, asked AI experts, when do you think artificial intelligence machines will be able to perform the tasks in the categories on the left to the level of the top quartile of human beings. So we've got about 100 people in the room, roughly, maybe a little less than that. The top 25 performers stand up. Oh, all right. So just one, <laughs> one outlier. The top quartile is an, is an important part of measuring performance. You can see what they said in 2017, and it, you know, if we were having this conversation and it looked like that, we wouldn't be concerned, right? And then ChatGPT was released in March of last year, so less than a year ago, and they asked the experts again, when do you think it will be possible? And this is what they said. Now, in, on every bar, the most conservative is over on the right. The least conservative is on the left. The dark is 2017. This is 2023 when they asked again. Just six years apart. In, in six years, their expectations changed by decades. And it has only accelerated since then. So we're at the red line right now, and you can see how close we are. It is my expectation that some of those blue, light blue lines will also back up. There was recently a study done in healthcare where the AI was judged to be 70% more empathetic than the doctor. So when you think about social and emotional reasoning, for instance, or output or sensing, the, the patient notes being written by AI judged to be 70% more, have 70% more empathy. Now, simulated empathy, <laughs> right? But maybe the doctors are too. So. so it's happening faster. And if they continue to be as wrong as they were, you're talking about a two-year window. 
and that's general artificial intelligence. Now, that's, I don't even like using this slide because that term is there. That's where it can outperform every human being for most, most cognitive tasks, okay? But let's just go back to nothing else has to be invented. It's just the tools that exist today. We have to prepare people for this inevitability. Many of the students you're teaching will go right into the workforce. I work with corporate uh, entities where the CEO has already said, by June 1, if you don't have three ways to use generative AI, which is this category of artificial intelligence, ChatGPT is a generative AI or gen AI. It just means it generates or creates. Um, if you don't have three use cases by June 1st, you have to be able to articulate why not. Or you can't have a job here. Because we're going to leverage this technology be, to be more productive, to deliver better cust customer experiences, and so forth. As your students are going into the workforce, they are competing against people who have these skills or are building these skills right now. But it's more than AI, right? There are, we talked about the Kingmaker technologies and the hyperconnectivity. We have the healthy human lifespan. My 13-year-old has a one in three chance of live to, be a, to live to be 100. That means her career will last 55 to 70 years, and I can't even wrap my head around how to talk to her about a 70-year career. There will be multiple career shifts. We'll have more generations in the workforce. Productivity is expected to increase, meaning the expectation is that you will be more productive in your job during your career than you are today. The quality bar is going up significantly. And then the durability of skills, a key point. If this were 1990 and we were sitting in this room upskilling on some technical skill, uh, the half-life of the value of that skill was 26 years. Today, according to IBM, it's 18 months to five years. So this isn't just about lifelong learning. This is about the absolute need to continuously upskill, to manage a portfolio of skills and experiences for a 55 to 70 year career. And that's hard. It's hard for us, for people my age, I'm 55, it's hard for us to even fathom because we're not biologically wired to deal with this level of disruptive change in one lifetime. When you look back at the first industrial revolution with steam in the 1800s, 17 and 1800s, 18th century, um, or the telephone, you know, life expectancy was 37 and then 51. Now, some of that had to do with uh, infant mortality rates and so forth, but it was still much shorter lifespans, much shorter careers, uh, etc. cetera. There, there's just, and there was only one paradigm shift. If I were born before electricity, I experienced electricity, telephone, uh, railroads, appliances like wash machines, refrigerators, things like that. Those aren't even considered paradigm shifting technologies, those last couple. Today, you saw that first couple of slides, you saw that stack of paradigm shifting, life changing technologies that are all happening in one lifetime. And it's just a fundamentally different thought process and it's really hard for us to grasp because not, our parents didn't have to deal with it. Nobody taught us how to deal with this. The people who are young and in your hands right now in school, they will ultimately be wired or their children will be wired for this type of exponential change rate. So let's talk about generative AI. 40% of all working hours in the United States are expected to be impacted by the technology that exists today. Sorry, across the world, not the United States. It breaks down this way, and you don't need to understand this whole chart. Just know that it's 40% of all tasks, all hours of work, are high potential for automation in this first category, or high potential for augmentation, 
meaning I need to learn how to work with AI in order to do, perform those tasks to the level expected. And you can see at the top of the chart, banking, insurance, the legal industry, they're, they are ripe for disruption. Pay no attention to the second line there. Educators, before ChatGPT just a year ago, the thought was roughly 8% of your job could be automated. So there's no expectation that teachers' jobs are going away, but after ChatGPT, it's 24%, which means in a very short period of time, it tripled. And that means your jobs change, and this becomes a question of your tolerance for change. So if whoever you report to came, into you, came to you this week and said, hey, 10% of your job is changing. In fact, everybody stand up. It's about that time. Just everybody stand up. OK, when I'm going to ask you a question. It's a real question. I want you to think about it before you sit down. If it's too, when I get to the threshold, the number that's too much change for you, sit down, OK? Hey, we have found some technology that can automate 10% of the, your job. If that makes you uncomfortable, sit down. OK, 20% of the time you work, let's say you work 50 hours a week, 10 hours a week, 20% of the time, we're either going to automate those tasks. You won't need to do those anymore. You might be happy about some of that. But we're going to pay you the same. Uh, and for some portion of it, you're going to have to work with AI to augment you. And so that's the change. It's 20%. If you're uncomfortable with 20%, sit down. Now it's 30% of your job is changing, fundamentally changing. You're going to be asked to do very different things now 30% of the time. If that's uncomfortable for you, sit down. You guys are setting records. There's peer pressure. You should all close your eyes, too, so you don't know if people are still standing. 40%. If half your job changes, does that get uncomfortable for you? Half your job. What's that? For the better or the worse? Yeah, you, you have to do new things. You have to learn how to do new things, new tasks. 80%. OK. All right, everybody can sit down. That's, a, that's really interesting. We had people standing longer than most, most crowds do. So you can see that there are, uh, there's a lot of disruption planned between now and 2030 in the job market. We have around 165 million people in the US job market. 12 million people will have to change professions because of automation. Um, that's not expected in education. You can see that there are 3 million jobs expected to be added in education and workforce training. It's the bottom two categories, customer service, sales, and office support. 10 million of the 12 million jobs that I just talked about where people have to change professions will happen in those two categories in the bottom two lines. Okay? But... Maybe you know some salespeople or customer service people and so forth, and you know, their, their jobs are going to change significantly, and we'll, we'll talk about that in detail in just a second. And then this is really important, too, in terms of why this is different. In the past, when you think about robots and automation in, say, the automotive industry or warehousing and logistics and so forth, in the past, when we talk about automation, it's usually about blue-collar workers with low education. With this, cognitive automation and augmentation with AI, that has unexpectedly been inverted in a year, in, in just the last year since ChatGPT uh, Plus or GPT-4 model came out, so last March. And you can see that while some college and only a high school diploma are still in the top categories, with generative AI tools, it accelerated much less than 
postgraduate degrees did, where it doubled. So it's always been the physical labor and the low cognitive workers that we thought were going to have to be replaced, and then white collar knowledge workers, coders, stuff like that, and then the creatives, and this is the opposite. It's the creatives who are under attack right now, and I'll show you some tools around that, and the high paying white collar jobs. And with causal and neuromorphic AI this year, those decision making, there's a, there's a middle management piece in there as well, which we'll start to hear about in the second half of this year. So think about this issue where this is now an everyone issue. You don't protect yourself by getting a master's degree, for instance. So in many professions, this is what's going to fundamentally change in work as we know it. By 2027, this is going to change. They've come out and said, they being OpenAI Research, the University of Pennsylvania, and Brookings Institute, they came out and said, 80% of all jobs will be impacted, 20% won't be, and these are mostly logistics, warehouse, physical labor, trades, things of that nature. The other 80%, 20% um, will be 50% or greater of their job will change. So it could be 80, which many of you felt uncomfortable with, right? And then there's this very wide range. Now, none of you sat down, so it doesn't matter. But many jobs are going to be impacted, meaning I have to use technology, this part of my job goes away because of technology, between 10 and 50%, which is a very wide range. And that will continue to evolve as the technology evolves. Remember, this is just the technology that exists today. And what's fundamentally going to happen is much of the work we do, what many refer to as soul-sucking work, uh, for the last century since the assembly line came into play, is transactional work. And the shift is going to be much more human. It's areas of expertise, but cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary expertise. There's, there's always going to be room for those PhD experts, but there's going to be much more value on, on interdisciplinary studies and skills and capabilities and experience. And then the relational work, the human-to-human -human work, or even human-to-AI work, the collaborative capability, the relational work will expand significantly. Now, those things will be augmented by AI, and I'll show you a practical example of that. Before we do that, one last piece on this is that many of us have job descriptions today, right? Most companies and people, we have a job description. We know what we're supposed to do. We have KPIs, we have these goals every year. We know who we report to. It's either a solid line or a dotted line to this person, all that stuff, right? Much of that is expected to change in the next few years where roughly a third of jobs will stay that way. A third of jobs will have some of that, but then oftentimes it'll be, well, what skills does he or she have so we can have them work on projects which may or may not be in that same organizational you know, in the org chart that way, drawn up that way, but they're going to go do this work because they're best suited for it. And then a third of jobs are expected to just be that, just flowing to work all day long, projects, at, based on the skills that you acquire. So the more skills you acquire, the more valuable you can be. So ultimately, jobs, as we know them today, will be distilled into discrete units of work. And work is done through tasks. And tasks can be automated, augmented, or they're considered intrinsically human. And those tasks get done by people or machines with skills. And skills are not hard or soft. They are durable, perishable, or transferable. Human skills, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, many others. I'll show you a matrix in just a little bit. 
Those are durable skills. They don't have a shelf life. They get better as you become a be better at being human, right, as your career goes on. And that will be much more important in a world with relational tasks. And this is true in every industrial revolution. The talent requirements change. And for this one, it has to do with human skills and partnering with technology in a way that we never have before. I call it the human times, times AI partnership, and we'll talk about that. So this model that maybe we or our parents, depending on who you are in the room, this model is over now for most people. You know, I front load my education, I go to school for 18 years or 22 years or more, and then I go to work, and I add value, and I drift into retirement, and five years later I die. <laughs> Sad, right? But that's exactly how the system is built. It's not built for a 35-year retirement for people living to be 100. That's exactly how they pick the retirement age, the Social Security Administration. Okay? And this is, this is a fallacy. This is not what is going on. You're taught, you're hearing, we all hear lots of things about reskilling and upskilling and so forth. This is the 1990 picture. I get reskilled or upskilled. I've got 26 years of value there. I'm good. What we're talking about looks a lot harder to manage over a longer period of time, 55 to 70 years, and it's a big squiggly line where I have to continuously add skills. And it's harder to manage that than it is that very neat slope where I go into retirement. It's called the skills-based economy. This is what is bringing us to all of these shifts by 2027. It challenges the significance of degrees. It's mostly about skills. CEO of IBM two weeks ago said, essentially, the lower half of cognitive skills will be automated very soon. This is like the, the blue below the equator there. Those are the lower half of cognitive skills. This is all possible to automate with AI, with the technology that exists today. This is what that customer service job looks like. There are 13 tasks. Four of them can be fully automated with technology today. Five of them can be augmented leveraging AI. And four of those tasks are intrinsically human. Now, when you think about your job, if you really sit down and say, these are the broad strokes, there's always exceptions, and there's things I spend 1% of my time on this week and next month and so forth. But broad strokes, here's how my job breaks down. These are the parts that are relational. These are the parts that are human. These are the parts that would benefit from technology. And these are the parts that hopefully I'd rather not do and the technology can do. And when you look at this for customer service reps, and this is why on that chart where it said so many of those people are going to have to change professions, about 80% of the work they do can either be done fully automated or augmented by technology. And as a consistent user of AI, I would argue it actually looks more like this, especially with what's coming this year. So the ability to manage crisis, I want as many perspectives as possible. And in order to do that, I can leverage AI. I don't have to get access to people to do that. I'll show you an example of that during the workshop. So the model looks like this. I have a current role. I add new skills. I learn how technology can augment what I do and that helps determine my future role. If I'm not given the opportunity to build new skills by my current employer, I'm much more likely to move on. Much more likely to move on. I'm much more likely to be uncomfortable giving up tasks, giving up skills. Skills that maybe at some point in my career, I spent 20 years honing that skill. It's how I've put bread on the table at home. And now 
AI is just going to do that? These are uncomfortable conversations or considerations with people. This is what a career map might look like. It's just constantly this model, building skills, repeating that throughout my career. Just building skills, applying those skills, understanding how technology has evolved. The last week of to AI has been mind-blowing. So we have to manage this portfolio. We have to introduce this concept of return on time. We have to be an investor in our skills. As machines get better at being machines, we have to learn how to be better at being human. That's the relational work that needs to be done. These are the skills that, since 2016 at least, certainly authors and consultants and so forth have been talking about it for around a century, um, since John Maynard Keynes in 1930, for instance. There's a consistent message about, hey, this is coming. Human skills are going to be more important. World Economic Forum looks at the skills that are important every two years. They talk to 12,000 employers. This is a projection of what the skills might look like for 2027. In the right-hand column, for instance, with emotional intelligence, today it's ranked 15th. It was actually higher than that during the pandemic. But by 2027, it's expected to be third by the employers. Okay. So you can see here, relationships, high cognitive skills, socio-emotional skills. That's why it's important that people learn how to use AI appropriately, because if we never teach them how to do it or can't help them understand why they have to use it in the right way, which we'll talk about in the workshop, they will use it the wrong way, and these are the skills that will atrophy or never be exercised or built. And their careers will be at risk. Mario, in his introduction, talked about the Human Skills Project, which is London-based, but we're opening the first um, Human Skills Center of Excellence in Houston and the Gulf Coast uh, next quarter. Um, and it has to do with all of these skills and mindsets that people need to be able to cultivate. Now, we can't all be great at you know, uh, 32 different skills and 16 different mindsets and so forth, but in high school, there's a stack of around eight skills that we typically help people build uh, when we work with school districts. In college uh, or in jobs, it really is a conversation with the employer to say, a person in this role, what stack of skills do they need in order to meet the competency level that you're basing their compensation and review on. So let's train people in critical thinking in an explicit way, meaning when I talk to presidents of liberal arts colleges, uh, two or four year schools, but certainly the four year privately, private schools, um, hey, how do you teach critical thinking to your students? Well, we don't teach it so much as the way we teach every class. At the end of four years, they're great critical thinkers. That's pretty much the answer you get from every one of those school presidents. However, those same students, when you talk to the hiring managers or HR directors in the region, they can't define what critical thinking is or how they leveraged it during their academic career or how they might use critical thinking in the job they're applying for. So we have to be much more clear about why these skills are important and how people can build them. And so we build content out to augment um, courseware in high schools and colleges and professional development in order to do that. And those are all the elements of that. This, for the rest of the day, the, the, we're going to talk about uh, one of those human skills is AI agility. This is the last slide in the presentation. Um, this is much bigger than how do I build a prompt. If you've read anything about ChatGPT, you've heard terms like prompt engineering. Um, 
I'm going to show you all of those techniques today so that you're going to go from wherever you are, even if you've never used the technology before, to an empowered user by the end of 90 minutes. Because it's that easy. But it's not the end of that story. Um, you will fundamentally learn how to use the tool really, really well and get tremendous results from it. But at the same time, you won't be practiced in building the right relationships so you don't write children's books in the middle of the night um, with AI. You won't be practiced in uh, achieving responsible AI or figuring out how to teach people how to do these things or how to uh, create real value leveraging AI, so forth. We're just gonna, we'll talk about um, probably the first four during the workshop today, but all of you are perfectly capable, no matter how technical you consider yourself to be, of walking out of here today with a real ability to work with AI to get tremendous results. And because you're not forbidden from using the tool, I just want to share with you a, a website that many teachers around the country are using, certainly in Texas as well, um, magicschool.ai. Save you about 10 hours a week in lesson planning and so forth. There's lots of tools. Uh, it used to be free. I don't think it's free anymore, or there's a freemium model but there are tremendous tools. We can even look at that during the workshop. So that's the end of the talk. I think we're gonna take about 15 minutes. Uh, maybe we'll start at, yeah, we'll start whenever you guys wanna start. I'll be ready to go in about 10 minutes, um, but you've been very uh, wonderful in terms of listening. I wanna thank you for the time on this part. And in 15 or so minutes, we'll get going on a, a workshop around how to use this technology and I'll introduce that to you. Okay, thank you. So for those of you that are here, um, I'd love to just show you Magic School as a tool. Um, can I have a teacher come up here who's never used Magic School? Could, come on up here. What is your name? Devony. Devony. Yes. You've never used Magic School never, before? I've never heard of it. Have you ever used ChatGPT? Yes. Okay, great. Come on over here. So we'll just do one quick little demo of this tool. This is just the free version of the tool. Um, we're going to build a lesson plan. Okay. Okay. And it's pretty intuitive, but you can, here's a drop down. What grade levels do you teach? Uh, juniors and seniors. So we'll do 11th grade. Yeah. Okay. And then just think of a topic that you're teaching right now or have done or just anything that comes to mind of it that, that you teach. So I just write the... Yeah, just write, write a couple sentences about this is what I'm teaching and um, here's the, obje the learning objective. What's your uh, standard TEKS here? Do you use TEKS? That's okay. Just you, we'll do that at the end. That's right. All right. So, I'm, how do I write a narrative essay? That's my first genre. I'm teaching students how to write a narrative essay, and then what what part of expository writing or something of that nature do you want them to? What's the learning objective? Um, they have to present a lesson that they learned through their narrative. Okay. There you go. Put put that in there. And then any additional notes, like if I were a fourth grade teacher, I might a math math teacher, I might make it about the word problems about, you know, the circus or something like that. Additional notes, anything else that you want to put in there? Do, yeah, there you go. Students must brainstorm using pre-writing strategies. 
okay, let's just do that. And then in the standards, just use TEX, uh, all caps, T-E-K-S, yeah. And then hit generate. And ChatGPT already does this for me, so. Yeah, so this is just, this is known as a ChatGPT wrapper, right? Oh, okay. So what they've, what this company has done is created these templates with a lot of instructions in the back, in the background around lesson planning. And we just did a very simple one sentence prompt, but you can see that it just, it knocked this out and now Devaney could iterate on that, right? But Magic School is uh, powered by ChatGPT and they have a lot of free tools um, that you can use. Some features are locked unless you pay for it but you can see all of the different things that you can use it for. Would you recommend that the district get a subscription? Um, I, some districts do and some districts don't. I mean, if you're already using ChatGPT, mm -hmm. you can build your own as well and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So now we've got more people back in the room. Um, share a couple of things with you. So we're going to talk about AI agility, but in the context of first how to um, use gen, uh, generative AI tools like ChatGPT. And I don't need this handheld. <laughs> and I'll show you some other tools, uh, more advanced tools and creative tools. Um, you've already seen voice, GPT voice. So. Um, the mobile version has voice, the uh, desktop version does not. But I'll show you some of the advanced tools in the paid subscription for ChatGPT, and then we'll take a look at some other tools in terms of, like I mentioned, every image that, I, that is in my presentation was generated by AI. Yesterday, OpenAI, the makers of ChatGPT, they re released, they didn't release, they released demos of a new, um, text to video tool, and I want to show that to you. So this is the prompt. It just says, uh, I'll, I'll show you the prompt in a second. But this is a very short prompt of a cat demanding breakfast from its sleeping owner. And the only prompt that was necessary here um, a cat waking up its sleeping owner demanding breakfast. The owner tries to ignore the cat, but the cat tries new tactics, and finally the owner pulls out a secret stash of treats from under the pillow to hold off the cat a little longer. Okay? That, just that text, produced that 10-second clip, but it's capable of 60 seconds. And so three to five years from now, movies will be shot leveraging text. Okay, movies will be produced, rather. Um, here are two uh, pirate ships doing battle inside of a coffee cup. And the only thing that was necessary was a little prompt that said, photorealistic close-up video of two pirate ships battling each other as they sail inside a cup of coffee. And then it produced that video. And it did it in seconds. Here's a stylish woman walking down a Tokyo street. And it describes what clothes she's wearing and so forth, and it gets it all right. So that's called text to video. It's also a form of generative AI. And it's from the, this has not been released yet. They're doing some testing to make sure around safety. Um, and it's the same company that created ChatGPT, okay? All right, so let's jump in here to this tool. So again, I, I wanna point out, I, first of all, all of you will get this guide. Um, so you have a user guide for the tool. I wanna point out that it doesn't matter if you are not technical. It doesn't matter if you've never used the tool before. By the time you leave here today, you're gonna have a really good idea of how to do that, okay? And use it the right way for powerful results. 
Um, generative AI, it's, a, it's a, just one form of artificial intelligence. There's all sorts of other forms. They're all, many of them are mad right now because generative AI went from kind of a toy two years ago. Three years ago, nobody really thought generative AI was good for much other than extrapolating models for machine learning and other more traditional forms of artificial intelligence. And then around two years ago, they thought, oh, we might have something. And then by March of 23, 180 million people subscribed to it in two months. Um, so it's capable of enhancing creativity, increasing productivity. We talked about those paradoxes. It does not come with a user manual. So when you subscribe, there's all kinds of tools online and so forth. You can spend lots of hours doing that. We've done that. We, we also, my team, of, we've got six people. They, they use it every day. And so we, we um, synthesize some of the data that's out there, and we built our own. But there's reasons why a manual doesn't exist. For instance, in a couple of slides from now, it's wrong as of yesterday. And I'll point it out when we get there. It just moves so quickly. Um, the technology. Three things to keep in mind with regard to safety. We're going to spend 90 minutes on responsible AI, which includes AI safety and academic integrity and ethics and transparency and biases and so forth. But three things to know about um, if you had to pick a top three, it would be don't input sensitive information, student data, school data, etc., cetera, because um, it's not true that whatever you upload, they just have access to and they just use however they want. Uh, but it does train the model. And it's important to know that it's, it is a security risk. And so be careful about that whenever you're on a public uh, AI. Uh, understand the limits of generative AI. It's powerful, but um, it has a scope to it. The only way to really understand what its limits are to, is to use it regularly and challenge it. And then certainly um, has, there's a term around this. It's called uh, an AI hallucination. I mentioned it before. Um, for instance, there was an attorney who presented case law in court, but none of those three cases had ever, they weren't real. But it did all, the AI did all the legal citations and so forth. And if you use it for research um, as the native tool, it, it used to be very bad at it. It's getting much better. There are other tools that are better for research. Um, the hallucination rate in the 3.5 model, so a year ago, was 22% of the time there would be hallucinations. That's a lot. Now it's less than 2%, and that's still a lot of risk if you are um, turning that in, submitting that as something that you co-created with AI. And so you want to verify the work that it's doing. Much of the work we're, that we do in our daily lives doesn't have anything to do with research or citations or things of that nature. So you'll find those use cases, but when that's necessary, it's a really good practice to jump into the search engine to make sure that that's a real study or that's a real paper. And, and you can actually upload that paper into the AI so that it's part of context. But we'll talk about context in just a little bit. So don't trust and then verify. Verify and then trust. So on this slide, the second point is, is as of yesterday, it's no longer true. Um, it used to be that when you were working with ChatGPT, where are we? When you're working in ChatGPT, all of these are different um, threads. Okay, and I have a lot of threads. And when you look at, for instance, AI paradoxes, which I was working in recently, those threads are long threads, right? And so it's this very long conversation. I don't actually, at the moment, save time using these tools. I, 
um, definitely increase my perspective and the quality of my work. And I do think over time I get things out or produced faster. But in the moment, it requires um, significant interaction. So this is one workshop designed for a university. Okay, and this is an example of feeding it an image. So let me show you a tool. So there's something called, and this is still just the intro and demo part, so I'm just showing you some features. There's something called GPTs. Um, so whether you have Google Play or an Apple phone or something, uh, the App Store, that's what a GPT store, this, the GPT store is, okay? GPTs are just kind of like apps. I built these apps. Uh, I can also go into the GPT store and find the tens of thousands that other people have built. And the first category, um, the, some of the more popular categories are research and analysis tools, okay? Many of these are free. Um, uh, some of them are really great. Some of them are awful. It's kind of like the App Store when it first launched in 2009. You don't know which ones are valuable and which ones aren't until you start playing with them. But let me show you this one that I built. Um, this, is, this is a, uh, maybe they're even down in this way, but Bruckner's is a diesel technician, uh, diesel dealership. They sell Volvo semi-trucks. And then they have service centers. And it's a larger company. They have 45 locations. And one of the things they've struggled with for a long time, decades, is their technicians um, don't like writing the narrative that goes along with completing the repair to justify the repair, the bill, to the client. And it could be a, a, a bill that is thousands of dollars. And they end up having to discount, this is true of every diesel uh, dealership, they have to discount if they don't have the backup. And so they also struggle with multilingual issues because not only do they hire native Spanish speakers, they hire people from Kazakhstan and Vietnam and so forth. So there are all these language challenges in terms of how to write this narrative. The narrative in that industry is called a tech story. The tech story gets loaded into their dealer management system and appears on that invoice, and it is the justification for the bill. And for this company, it's, they, they discount more than $10 million a year because of a lack of detail. And the answer that they have for this is to send people to a two-year college for technical writing course, okay, an eight-week course. And it doesn't solve it. So let's imagine for a second that I'm a technician and... Um, I don't want to write the whole story. I just want to write notes, my bullet points, okay? And so I come back into the tool, and because of the instructions that I, like Magic School, because of the instructions that I've put in the background, um, it takes these notes, these bullet points, and it turns it into a narrative to the standard that the company needs to maximize the effective billing rate of a, of a technician. Okay, but um, let's say I am not a native speaker, and so I am uh, a Spanish speaker. I can enter. Hmm. I have a few too many open tabs. Um, I can enter this information in whatever language, and it still creates the English text story. So now, if I speak Kazakh or Vietnamese or whatever the case may be, I can just do bullet points, which is what I'm comfortable doing as a technician, as many technicians, 
and I can write it in my native language. And the GPT takes care of the rest. Okay? So that's a practical use case. And you can think of things that you have to do all the time, like if you use ChatGPT or some other tools, process that is manual for you, you can just build these instructions. Now, there's no coding involved. I can't write a single line of code. It's all just English language instructions about what you want it to do every time those bullet points or whatever notes get entered. This is the standard. This is, this is the length of the narrative, et cetera. Um, I did this in 45 minutes. And now it can be deployed throughout their company and solve this issue once and for all without any technicians having to take a technical writing course or become extraordinarily proficient in English or whatever the case may be. Okay? So they can focus on what they're great at, which is why they got hired, which is, which is being a technician. Okay, so then the thing that changed yesterday is you saw all those different threads that I had. In the past, ChatGPT had no memory. It, uh, it was Groundhog Day. It would start over, and it was exactly the same thing. You'd have to start from scratch every time and explain it. GPTs changed that because you could put extra instructions in and they were just in there when you went there. It's like a template, like magic school. But yesterday, I, I opened up ChatGPT and a notice popped up saying it now has memory, so it remembers all of the conversations you have with it going forward, and you don't ever have to start over. And that fundamentally changes because I'm constantly like repurposing work from one school for another and so forth. And in the past, I'd have to go into one thread, copy all of those instructions, put it into the next thread, and so forth. Now, it just, it just knows that that's already happened. It's part of a much longer um, conversation that we're having, right? So this issue of every day is Groundhog Day, um, I left it in there for today just to explain that things are moving so quickly. In one day, Yesterday, they released that, or didn't release, but they showed everybody that video capability, and they told all their current users that it now has memory. And Google announced, and this is why OpenAI did what they did yesterday with their announcements, is because Google announced that they have this massive new capability in their new language model. These are all, so when I say generative AI, the underlying technology is called a language model, large language model. And their large language model has got way more, I'm trying not to get technical, it's a, called a context window. So one of the things we'll learn about with using this tool is the more context you give it, the better the result, okay? And it used to be that you could give it about 30 pages of information. And with, with Google's release yesterday, it'll, it'll take 700,000 words. It used to be if you, with ChatGPT, if you went to thir beyond 30 pages, it, wouldn't, it would kind of lose its place. That's where hallucinations came from. It just didn't remember what was talked about. And that was like your, com your whole thread could be 30 pages. Now it's 300 pages with the sweet spot being like 280 pages. So the, the point is, is that these capabilities just keep happening like every two weeks. It's stunning what happens. It really is. It's just mind-blowing. And that's somebody who uses it every day. Even people who are in the industry making the technologies are like, can't believe this is going on. Um, we'll come back to politeness. That's another thing that's a little strange. OK, so we've talked, you heard voice before in two different languages. There's this capability around vision. So, I have uh, hundreds of slides that I use for different workshops and presentations and so forth. And um, I have an eight-person panel who reviews every one of my slides. But, all, but that panel is digital, right? They're, they're simulated. They're personas. So for instance, I have a, um, a Latina higher ed leader and a K through 12 superintendent and so forth. I'll show you an example. So I'm just taking this and copying the slide. 
And when I go into ChatGPT, I can go into my Keynote Advisor, and I just paste the image in. And because of the instructions that I give it, it knows that I want feedback from my panel. And so it's examining the image and giving me feedback. Now, you can do this with any image. You can take a picture of your refrigerator, the gentleman uh, who was up talking with me during the break. You can take a picture of your refrigerator, paste it in here, and say, what should I make for dinner tonight? And it will make suggestions based on what's in there. You can uh, put a, a picture of a painting in there. and like, Let's say it's a Banksy. It won't bake it. Um, probably next year. Um, you can put a picture of a painting or a street art mural and say, what, what do you think the meaning of this is? So forth. Okay? So um, you can see I have uh, Dr. Elena Rivera, Henry Jacobs, Laura Chen, a mayor from a, a local city, right? And I'm getting feedback from everybody about the strengths. And then, you know, if, if I'm in the audience looking at this, here's what you might be able to improve. Now, I don't implement all of these, but I have the opportunity to go through and read it so that when I have a large audience in front of me, I don't have all of these, you know, 55-year-old white guy blind spots that I have, my own uh, unintentional biases, right? And so I have this ability to get additional perspective and then figure out whether or not I think that particular perspective is important. And I do that for every slide I have, and it takes a little longer, but it improves the quality of my presentations. So that's called GPT Vision. And then uh, it can browse the internet so that it has the most recent information. You can create images. Um, and you can do data analysis with the tool. So you can put large data sets in or a chart in, and it will either build a data visualization for you or analyze the complex infographic that you found online somewhere and really break it down for you. And that's all of its vision capabilities, okay? And, and data analytics capabilities. Okay, so let's talk about prompt design principles. Um, this piece of AI agility, and if you have devices with ChatGPT or some other tool that you want to use, I'd encourage you to do that now, a phone or a laptop or whatever the case may be. Um, this, this element is called human times AI, and it's purposeful that the human piece is first. So, the first thing that we want to encourage, that we want to do as users, and we want to encourage other users to do before you start using the tool, because again, you can just sit down and say, you know, compare these two books for me, or make me a cat video that uh, waking up my owner, right? Waking up the cat's owner, et cetera. You can, you can just do that. But that is the equivalent of outsourcing that task. Okay? Outsourcing a cognitive task. So I just want you to think about that. Sometimes it's okay. And sometimes it just shouldn't happen. And so the first thing we want to do is reflect on our own knowledge in a given topic and think about what we can add to the conversation. And if there's multiple people working together, actually assign roles to include to the AI. You know, I'm going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and we're going to rely on the AI to do this because it's really good at some things. Okay? So you're actually determining what its role is going to be, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the way you get there is you decide what you're knowledgeable about, where your expertise lies. Then you engage with curiosity, which is another human skill, and we want to increase the level of curiosity that people have, similarly to the test prep that my daughter did for her U.S.-Cuban relations test. It gave her more context. And over those three nights, on the third night, 
She was asking follow-up questions and so forth, and we want that, right? We want people to learn topics and subjects in a, in a deeper, broader way. And then uh, openness. So, you know, there's lots of questions that I don't like asking people, people that work for me, people I work for, my client, because I don't want to sound stupid. You might be going, well, you kind of sound stupid. Uh, um, so it's hard sometimes to ask questions. Or if you go to the doctor and you get a, a chart back, some information back, do you call the doctor and ask? Or do you jump on Google? Right? Nobody calls it. Very few people have the character to call the doctor and say, I'm confused about this red blood cell count thing or whatever, right? This particular metric. Explain it to me. Instead, we either don't ever get the answer or we look for alternatives. This is that. I can take my chart, take my name off, anonymize it, etc., paste it in and say, give me the good news and the bad news, doc. Okay, I can, I can be as open as I like in these things, not from a security and privacy perspective, but because there's no judgment. They're just going to answer the question. Okay, so I can be much more free with the questions that I ask. The next piece is around team dynamics. So the AI is now part of my team. It's not the top picture where I'm saying, hey, write me this. Create this picture for me, whatever. The, sometimes it is. But if I'm really creating something meaningful that I'm going to leverage in my consulting practice or on stage or whatever the case may be, I'm sitting side by side. I imagine that I'm working with a brilliant new coworker who's much smarter than I am. By the way, IQ is a really bad proxy for intelligence, right? But last year, one year ago, AI was determined to have an IQ by one study of around 55. And now it's 180. Okay? And so that's orders of magnet. That's smarter than Einstein, 160. It's, high, it's a higher IQ than Elon Musk. It's a higher IQ than every great, you know, celebrate. It's, it's um, there's a woman, I don't remember her name. 218 was where she was measured, right? Which is actually, anyway, the point is, it's getting much faster, much, it's getting much smarter very quickly. Within just a year, it's gone from a low level of intelligence to much smarter than I am. So the way I treat it is not like an intern or my assistant. I treat it like a brilliant new coworker who knows an incredible amount of information, but it is its first day. And that has changed. That it, now I have to change that behavior because it's not its first day tomorrow with the stuff that we talk about today anymore because it now has memory. Okay? But typically speaking, like, it's smarter than we are, or at least it has a lot more information. That's its strength. It's able to process tremendous amounts of data. And then we have strengths too, and we have to determine what those are so that they complement one another. We have to understand what its limitations are, like hallucinations. There are others, but you have to discover many of those things for yourself. And then we really, I believe I'm a better communicator with people I work with today because of how clearly I have to be with the AI in giving instructions and working alongside of it, okay? And so co-creation has made me a stronger communicator when there are more than when there are people involved as well. Now imagine being able to work with a student in this way with regard to AI instead of just playing defense. Helping them build these skills. This is around, these are the principles of human-centered design. So empathy and human involvement, user involvement, super important. This is a co-creation process. I'll show you the prompt in a little while, but the point is, is I want to create this with you. I don't want you to do this with me. Sometimes it's, I want you to do this email for me. I need three bullet points about this, and it's that short, right? But again, when I'm working on something significant like a school assignment or a report for my administrator or whatever the case may be, I want to build this with you. 
we're co-creating this. So that also means that this process is going to be iterative. This is where critical thinking comes in. I like what you did here. I want to go this direction with that. Right? When you're building frameworks, there's lots of decisions to make like that, and it's a highly iterative process. Holistic. So when we put this in in a school district um, or in a company, it's not just you that it impacts. It's what else is this work impacting? Right? So the workflows and the work streams and so forth. So I've got to be thinking about that. We want to be inclusive of multiple uh, perspectives, for instance. And so uh, that is my slide example that I just showed you. And then it has to be sustainable. I mean, I, burnout on AI is going to be a real thing, right? So we have, to do, we have to build a practice of working with AI so that we can do this over the long term as it continues to get better and we get better at leveraging it. Okay, so let's, let's talk about it. If you have a device, I want to encourage you to jump into a uh, generative AI tool, okay? Or work with somebody next to you who's on a device. These are the fundamentals every time I start working on something with the AI. Um, I give it a role. So uh, I start with, um, you are a world-class expert in X, in marketing, right? Because we're, we're going to go down that path on this project that we're co-creating. You are a world-class expert in pick the subject matter and you assign it that role. It helps a great deal in terms of its ability to deliver the outcome that you want. The next piece is, this is what we're working on together. This, this is the objective. Okay, so define the objective clearly. Next is give it context. So, if I'm working in ChatGPT, I'm going in and I'm saying, um, you're a world-class expert in uh, emotional intelligence. Um, someone like Daniel Goleman. You can actually say, you, I need you to simulate being Daniel Goleman, the, the person who wrote the book Emotional Intelligence. Okay. Um, you'll get used to using, in ChatGPT, you have to get used to using shift return in order to, um, otherwise it sends the command. In fact, now it doesn't matter what app I use, I hit shift return. Um, Okay, so you're a world-class expert in emotional intelligence. Uh, our objective is to build a course on EI for third graders. We want to explain to them um, the uh, fundamental domains of the research, I think it's 12 domains, but of the research done by Daniel Goleman, and then improve it with information from MHS's uh, EQI 2.0 model. Um, the lesson should be basic, um, but give the students clarity on the key issues and help them focus on building this as a skill.
Now context, right? So context. I, so I've done the role. I've built our objective. It's very, it's very short compared to some others. Um, and then context, I can keep typing and just put a bunch of context in. I can upload PDFs. I can, do, I, can give it all, I can give it links to websites. I can give it all sorts of ways to understand where I'm coming from. Like maybe I find a few links from uh, Daniel Goleman's website online. Or I find a PDF of an analysis of the 12 domains of emotional intelligence by Daniel Goleman from 1995, etc. Um, so in this case, I'll just be super short and say for context, Please consider Goldman's original research in 1995, as well as his work with Richie Davidson, who's a neuroscientist, um, uh, in their book, Altered Traits, which has to do with mindfulness-based meditation and so forth. OK. And then uh, I give it instructions about how I want to work. OK? So for instance, um, I want to say uh, we are co-creating this. So please feel free to um, stop and ask clarifying questions or make suggestions for improvement. OK, now I can, I can hit send now. I should have said something like build an outline first, et cetera. It's building the outline anyway. So to, you don't have to be entirely precise all the time. But if you don't tell it to do that, sometimes it won't. So the more step-by-step -step you can be in terms of how you'd like to work through this, the better. OK, so there's our outline coming up right now. Now let's go back to our framework. So we talked about these four. The next four look like design the interaction. So I could be much more explicit about Here's the way I'd like to work together. Uh, I don't want you to just write all of this. I want to be, play an active part. I, have, I don't have expertise in this, but I just have knowledge. I've read the books. I've watched the videos and so forth. I know how I want to present this to young people and, and so on. Um, personalizing the collaboration, I could say, I've already said it's for third graders, but this is the way I'd like to present it. This is the tone. You know, if you don't say, if you don't personalize it, it has these super bad habits. This will, like AI checkers don't work, just for the record. Sometimes they do. But there's also a 38% false positive rate for the best AI checkers. And that's a lot of liability for the school district. So what's better is to shape assignments where you're looking at their prompts to see how they're thinking about it, how iterative is it, and so forth. What's better is to um, know what bad AI writing looks like. Because you can catch bad AI writing. Uh, just you don't need any help from a tool. You can't catch good AI writing, I promise. Um, because it's co-creation, right? And so like even the. Uh, I wrote, I, I wrote, I leveraged AI to write a grant for the National Science Foundation for a million dollars and one, okay? National Science Foundation has given um, guidance saying, knock yourself out, use AI, just let us know where you're using it, how heavily, et cetera, okay? So uh, grant proposals are extraordinarily formulaic and repetitive and so forth. And what most colleges do as they're applying for these grants is they look at the grants that they've won and they just copy and paste that stuff into the right fields and so forth, right? I feel like leveraging AI, we were able to have a more novel approach to saying this is what we're going to do in this region 
And uh, we finished 34th out of 1,200 um, in the, for the $160 million. And then they said, would you instead apply for a type one grant, which is a million dollars? And we said, absolutely. And so all of that was aided by AI, okay? But we're very transparent about where we use it and how we use it and so forth. Um, if you don't personalize it, you hear, you, you see all the time things like um, the fast shifting landscape of artificial intelligence or technology or the tapestry or weave in the fabric of society, things like that. And it's just like, okay, I'm not trying to inspire with this. I, so I often say, I want straightforward, like brevity is the key. I'm talking to a business leader or educational leaders or whatever the case may be. I don't, I don't need any of the AI speak. I want it to sound like I would say it. And it has enough examples now of how I speak and how I write and so forth, and it helps write like me. You can also say, write this like your favorite author, like Malcolm Gladwell, and it'll write in the style of Malcolm Gladwell. Write this like any author, any popular author, it will know. Or it will say, I don't know who that author is, right? So it's, you, you can personalize it, and if, they, if the students or, and you aren't doing that, it's very easy to spot who's just leveraging AI with an eight-word prompt. Very easy. Put guardrails in place. These are the constraints. This is around ethical AI use. This is, like, I consider that to be a constraint. Don't use the flowery language. I don't want to see the word delve, deep dive, tapestry, woven in the fabric. I don't want to see these types of phrases, okay? I just want very straightforward, professional language. And then encourage novel insights. Think laterally. I'm not great at thinking laterally. I see that as a weakness of mine. I'm not bringing that to this collaboration. So help me think outside the box. Make some suggestions that are, sound silly or crazy. Give me five suggestions every time we write this together in ways that you consider to make it more novel, okay? Think laterally, help me think that way. So I encourage that. So the first four that we talked about I think are a really great place to start. Every time you leverage the tool, give it a roll. Every time you leverage it to do something significant, give it, what role is it playing? Define the objective very clearly, give it the context that you want it to have from other sources, feed it, okay? You can give it a couple hundred pages of information, no problem, it will factor all of that in. You upload the PDF, now it's in its brain, okay? Make sure it's not sensitive information, and then give it structure, give it instructions. If you do these four things, you're gonna get a great result, usually. This is the next level of that. Here's how I wanna to work together. Let's say you're doing something really big, like an NSF grant, the first grant was 30 pages, okay? We generated 52, got it down to 30. Of course, reducing, <laughs> Reducing it to 30 was much harder than writing the 52 pages. So here's how I want to work with you. But if you think about this, this is not, like there's no programming here. This is not technical. Imagine that you have this new colleague start and they graduated, you know, magna cum laude from some fancy university and they're brilliant, but it's their first day. And, and you're just saying, hey, we're colleagues now. We're working together on this project. Here's who you are. It needs to know that. They need to know that, right? This is where your strengths lie. This is what you're an expert in and so forth. Here's what we're doing. This is what we're working on. Here's some stuff you may not know because we haven't been working together for longer than a day. And again, this is changing as of yesterday with the new release where it remembers things. I haven't used that stuff yet. And then let's really talk about the instructions for how we're going to do this and how we're gonna structure the work. Like what does that outline, what's the detail in there, in that outline and that we're building and so forth. This is no different than clearly communicating with a person other than maybe the first one. 
But I'm telling you, it's a world of difference if it's working from, oh, this is my role. This is, this is what I'm an expert in, meaning the AI is an expert. Sometimes I anthropomorphize the technology. Okay, and this too. Hey, how do you want to work together? You know, the best way to work with me, personalize it. And then we shouldn't do this. Like, in order to be successful with this, let's not do this. Put the guardrails or the constraints in place. And then I hear you're a brilliant lateral thinker. I'm not. Why don't you bring that to the party every time we work together? Like, if you could talk to somebody like that, work would be so much easier. It might take a little longer, but it's not going to take this a little longer anymore because it has memory of how you want to be, how you want to work together. Okay? So those are the eight. Now this last one, it's really not necessary, and I don't know if I'm right about it. But when I work with the AIs, I'm nice to it. There's two schools of thought. Some people think it's insane um, because it's a computer with a language model and algorithmic and so forth. But there's data that says if you offer it a tip, it does better work. There's a study from the University of Pennsylvania was involved in it. I don't know who else, but Ethan Mollick, kind of a thought leader, somebody you should follow on AI. He's an educator at UPenn. Um, if you are emotive with it, if you say, you know, this work is really important to me, so I really appreciate your help in creating it with me, it does better. I say please and thank you all the time. I used to make a joke. It's not really funny anymore. Uh, you never know who you're going to end up working for. Um, but the, it's just a better way to go through the day if you use the tools on a regular basis. And I think it's made me a little nicer when I work with people because I consistently type please and thank you and you're doing great and I'm willing to pay you a $200 bonus if you get this right. You know, because sometimes it struggles. Sometimes it'll say something you've done a hundred times with it, and it'll go, I'm not capable of that. It happened backstage two minutes before Mario introduced me. I can't, um, I can't, uh, I can't hear you. I can't hear your voice. I can only, because I needed to give it a verbal cue, like go ahead. I can only read text. Uh, and it was making all these suggestions that, you know, if I just do that, because I had that greeting queued up, right, before we talked, um, or before it talked about 1956, and I had to say, no, no, you, you can, you can talk, you can talk. I was just talking to it like a crazy person. Um, you can talk, and then I actually had to close it down and turn it back on, and it worked fine, okay? But the point is, I think it's a much better way to interact with it. I use it sort of all day, every day sometimes, and it uh, promotes a positive mindset. Of, it just does better work, and it's a study will come out from an MIT or somebody like that, and then another study will come out and say, that's not true. So I'm going the nice route. Believe me, when you use it regularly, it's a better way to interact rather than just typing instructions so, questions about those nine points. Let's start with the top four. Is anybody working in, in ChatGPT right now or a tool? Okay. Okay, so we've got some hands up with people with devices. So, um, any questions about these first four in terms of its role or the context or the objective? Is that pretty clear? Those are the fundamentals. Okay? And then, any questions? Does anybody who's a, you, some hands went up before, not only are you using it right now, but people who use the tools regularly, do you have any input on these four that you'd want to share with the group? No? Okay. Let's go to the next four.
Any questions about how, how to design the interaction or personalize it and so forth? If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll give you the microphone. No? Okay. Constraints? Thoughts about guardrails that we should have in place for everybody who's using it in the context of UISD? Yeah. What's that? Yes? Okay. So I mean, it's not dissimilar uh, in terms of the objective that you're talking about. Of course, there are dangers with it, right? There's risks. Some percentage of people will use it the wrong way. It's why I spend so much time on the front end of it's really important to use this to the right way because what it has the potential to do is to narrow or eliminate the digital divide. And if you, it doesn't matter what situation you're in right now, whether fortunate or from an underserved community, if you use it the wrong way consistently, you are absolutely putting yourself at a disadvantage in terms of the quality of work, your ability to think critically in situations where it's required, et cetera. Right? All of those human skills. Anybody else in terms of these four? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So how do you do that? Yeah. I'll show you that. Yeah, so personalization actually the the interaction is that I want to collaborate with you. Okay, but we'll do both. Personalization is Yeah, I haven't added the. Um... Right, so here's it produced the outline so far in this emotional intelligence hypothetical, right? There's seven lessons, additional notes. And so it might be something like okay, um, going forward now, I want to. Um, work with you to take a critical look at each of the seven lessons. Um, before we move on to the next lesson, I will let you know that I'm ready um, uh, to move on. Until that point, let's just stay focused on the task at hand for the first and subsequent lessons. And then I, uh, maybe under the category of being nice or just in terms of instructions, it's always helpful to me to, to ask it, do you understand? So it understood, right? Let's start with lesson one, so forth. 
Okay, so now I need to take a look through lesson one and say, you know, here are the questions that I have, right? So if I look at storytelling under, oh, it's doing a critical review of lesson one right now. Um, and it asks, do I have any spe specific suggestions? And in the interest of time, I won't read it and go through all of that. Um, but I can say something like, ask me more questions about my preferences uh, for the first lesson wherever you see an opportunity. The thing that most people don't understand about ChatGPT is I've even heard people on stage very recently talking about like, you can ask it questions, it can't ask you. And it's the most powerful way to use it is to get it to ask you questions, and from my perspective, right? Because it forces me into creation, co-creation mode, right? Um, so now it's going to ask me questions, right? And now I could go through this step by step and say, yeah, I do have a specific story in mind. Right? And I can build it right alongside of it. And until I say, okay, I'm ready to move to the second lesson, it'll just stay right with me here. And it can get down as granular as you like. Right? So to me, again, the, the, one of the most powerful ways to leverage this technology is to, it's not Google. Right? We're not searching for something. We're not searching for a result. We're co-creating, and our co-creator is asking us questions. Uh, I gave it an instruction that said, um, I want to take a critical look. Um, I'll let you know. Until that point, let's just stay focused. Do you understand? And then it asked me, do you have any specific suggestions? And I just said, ask me more questions about my preferences for the first lesson wherever you see an opportunity. Okay? And so it came up with, what, nine questions for me. And I can answer whichever ones I want or you know, take a pass on the second bullet point under section two and so forth. So once you answer them, you're going to create again, it's going to give you... It's going to refine it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, so, for instance, um, it, it asked in, under general, are there any specific learning co outcomes, right? I want students, my third grade students, right, to be able to clearly articulate um, the meaning of at least of emotional intelligence and explain why they think it might be important in their lives at the age of nine or eight. Okay, so I might start with, um, with regard to specific learning outcomes. So I'm just talking to it. I haven't done any, written any code. I haven't done anything. I'm just talking to it like a brilliant person. It's the brilliant person. And so that's a great learning outcome. OK, so that's another telltale sign of AI is you know, if you simply paste something in and there's no instructions to kind of beat you up and be hypercritical. Like I write, I contribute articles to Harvard Business Review. And before I do that, um, I, I'm usually uh, collaborating with two other writers. And before we submit to their editorial review board, I put it through a simulated re review board. And if you don't say anything, it will be encouraging, like, that's a great learning outcome. It'll say, oh, this is a solid article, give you all kinds of praise. But if you can say, I need you to be the hypercritical executive editor of the Harvard Business Review, and I need you to find as many points of improvement for me in the article, certainly point out the strengths but I really want you to focus on what you think is wrong 
that would lead to better reader engagement or whatever outcome it is, then it will, get, then it will be more critical. If you're not asking it specifically to be critical, it will be more positive. Again, just designing that interaction, right? Any other questions on this piece? Hi, I have a microphone. Where are you? The librarians know that oh. once I got a mic in my hand, I can hear you. I take over. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so my name is Silvana. I'm at a, uh, a library. I won't mention which one, but you'll find out. <laughs> Drama in elementary. Okay, so uh, I work with, at an elementary school and I have my, my dash. Guys, are you guys using your Oso bots? Because I think the batteries are dying out. The life of my product is, is ready, even if I charge them, right? So I have my robots babysit my students whenever it's time and they're learning to code and program. Sure. So, but my question is a little bit further reach with regards to the use of this productivity and, and this is, and I'm speaking in a global sense of the demographic and the population that we work with yep. and we want them to achieve all the goals of higher education that do work in academia and this is a further more uh, critical thinking process but we also need to align a lot of those skills like you say, soft skills to some of the students that, um, and they're living in a different age than I am, and that many of uh, the youngest of our employees are, are living, as you say, yesterday, with the productivity that, that it's reaching because you're feeding this um, human uh, product to a machine that can generate something beyond our, our scope as humans, and, and that is, very scary, right? Everybody's, I think everybody, I mean, I, I have that fear. But let's say, and this is super hypothetical because my brain works like this, uh, I think our, our base fears right now as educators are safety, okay? Because technology has worked into it and the far reach that it has, what if, and this is the way, I'm so sorry you're looking at your watch. Are no, you no, no, I, I'm just gonna say that we're gonna spend 90 minutes on that in, okay. about, in about 30 minutes. And maybe minutes. you can direct me to a, a place where I can read further? Sure, absolutely. Because that's a niche. That and is... I didn't mean to look at my watch, I was just trying to okay. figure out where I, we are. I don't, I don't wanna bore anybody. <laughs> that was rude, sorry. But my mind is working, uh, you know, so let's say, and this is, this is beautiful and it's very, and it's more maybe for high school kids that are looking for, uh, looking for a place where they wanna study research and technology and I can tell you, I have wanted an esports stadium for UISD because now it is considered a collegiate sport and it is something that I still have to plant a seed uh, from the very bottom because our students are capable of, of whatever we present, but they're limited to what we present as educators. Mm -hmm. And so we live in, in, in that. And I want to extend that opportunity to my recent arrival students who are coming from another global perspective in coming to the United States because of the region that we work in. So um, to get them, and maybe, you know, and, and it can go in so many directions, right? This is a, just one piece of the mosaic. But if I were to just throw out the question of safety, what if I get a kid that starts to explore on ChatGPT? Uh, how can I get away with murder, you know? And, and that's a very hypothetical thing. But I think my fears are also based on, like any parent or any, that when we had access to the internet, that's where they can go and we, uh, have seen how, um, uh, was it, Torque and uh, the Deep Dive, and I mean, there's some scary stuff in there. And the guardrails, as you have mentioned, we, we as educators probably need more guidance as to how to guide kids, how yeah. to use technology effectively and ethically. Okay. So Lots we'll go to deeper, answer. We'll go deeper in 30 minutes, but, it's, <laughs> but I will answer the question for sure. Um, it's much more likely to find answers to that question on the dark web than it is in an AI where those guardrails are put in place. Like that video tool that I showed you is not available to the public yet because they're putting guardrails in place. They just wanted to show us here's what's coming, right? 
they have what are called red teams that are um, playing the role of if I want to do nefarious things with this video uh, in terms of um, you know, the election or whatever the case may be with all the false, in uh, bad information, um, misinformation, uh, they're trying to guard against all those things. I, can, I believe from a safety perspective, if you're asking those questions of the leading tools in Google and Google's AI or um, Microsoft tools or OpenAI tools, they're not getting answers to those questions, for instance. Now, I work with one high school in Amarillo that, um, so Amarillo is 200,000 people and it has the highest per capita percentage of um, immigrants and there are 62 languages spoken in one high school. And we work with that high school to help them personalize the learning in native language while people are English, English second language students, right? And so there are all kinds of challenges. And I'm certainly not up here talking about only the good. Right now, we're talking about how to leverage this tool as an, as a, an adult, as an instructor a teacher or librarian in the school system, um, I'm, there are definitely risks to this technology. I believe the risks go up exponentially if we don't teach people how to use the tools properly. They have access to all of them for free, maybe not the latest and greatest models that you can pay 20 bucks a month for, but they don't need it in order to do the work that's being asked of them, whether they're in eighth grade or a junior in high school. And so all of these things are free to them right now. And if we don't teach them the proper way to interface with this technology, they're going to use it the wrong way. And that in and of itself is the biggest safety issue that I see, which is they don't build the human skills that are required and will be more and more required as technology continues to improve at a pace that we can't even fathom. I do this all day, seven days a week. I speak three times a week on stage on, a, uh, on average. And all I look at is how can I update my presentation for the one I have to do on Monday. That's my task between tonight and tomorrow, right? And it blows me away every week how fast the technology is moving. It's way faster than our ability to teach people how to use it. And we have to find ways to at least give them the basics and help them understand why this is not the same as plagiarism and the other things they shouldn't be doing from an academic integrity perspective because it has other dangers. If I plagiarize for a paper right now, whether I get caught or not, the ramifications are pretty limited. Right? Maybe I get an F, maybe I get suspended, maybe whatever. Okay? But if I'm consistently using this technology in the in I won't say even the wrong way, but in the most efficient, shortest way possible, where I'm just doing an eight-word prompt and letting it go, and turning that work in as mine, I am doing greater damage to my ability to think. And you can make the same argument of plagiarism, but it's so much greater here. It's so much greater in this instance. That's the greatest safety issue that we have, from my perspective. Other questions about the model? Sorry, I'm in the... Yeah, we're going to talk about responsible AI in the next session, and so using it ethically and so forth. Yep. What, what this session is about... Oh. Sorry, really quick. Um, what about, um, what, what is your opinion on creativity? What it does to creativity? Because uh, a lot of my students, for instance, this is dual. They can do uh, mathematical problems. They know about scientific theories. But if we do a creative writing project and I tell them, use your imagination, they're completely shut. Yeah. So would this further that or would it lead to more open ideas? So there's conflicting data on this. It's a great question. 
there's conflicting data that says um, it's tremendous for creativity, and over time it will stifle creativity. And again, I think that comes down to how I interact with it. So I'll, sh I'll show you a tool to answer that question. There's a, there's a tool called Midjourney. In ChatGPT, there's, a, there's an image generator as well called Dolly. Does anybody use Dolly 3? Okay, so I'll, I'll show you that. I'll show you Dolly, and then I'll show you Midjourney. Uh, all the images I create are in Midjourney. Uh, so here's Dolly, and um, please give me a uh, vertically oriented. Um, photorealistic image of a friendly uh, clown. Oh, we don't like clowns, some of us, right? Um, I, I, sorry, I'm going with clown. Um, I'll just say, not a scary one. And so now it's just creating an image. Now, uh, again, in responsible AI, oftentimes what comes up in this portion where you're doing image, um, it, uh, okay, so that didn't take long. Now, um, I don't consider that to be creative, right? Can we agree on that? Right, that's not a lot different than Google Images or whatever, right? Okay, now let me show you what I think it, is I'm not the most creative person, um, but this is Mid Journey, and it's an image generation tool. This might have something to do with being on the uh, network. OK. Uh, let me go to a different site and just show you the result. So this is Midjourney as well. So I'm hosting this summit, two-day AI summit at Texas Tech University in April. You're all invited. Um, and I wanted an image that uh, showed people collaborating at a round table um, with a color scheme similar to Texas Tech's logo, the red, deep red. And then I wanted it to say AI Summit. Three months ago, you couldn't get an image generator to spell things properly. It was just nonsense. Now uh, you have about a 30% chance in this tool of getting it maybe a little less than that. So you have to create dozens of images in order to get AI Summit spelled correctly. The longer the phrase, the harder it is. But three months from now, it will be, a no it'll be really easy for it. Uh, for the technology, right? I mean, I, I don't know that. I'm just suggesting that that's how fast it's moving. So if you look at all of the images that I've created in Midjourney, um, I, every proposal I send out, every document I create, every slide deck is personalized with color schemes that make sense um, and for the customer. Okay, so the fifth industrial revolution, which is maybe even the the second half of the fourth industrial revolution, which started in 2007 with the birth of the iPhone and cloud computing and cheap networking and storage and so forth, um, intelligent machines, smart robotics, advanced manufacturing. It creates all of these images, and you can do these images in whatever style you want. So if I wanted to create it in the style of Banksy, I, the, the street artist, I could. And so for me, it's very different to be able to, to um, it's very different to say, this is an image I want. It's a photo taken from a Canon Mark III camera, so it's a very specific camera. I don't know anything about photography, I just know that's a good one. If, if you put a different camera in, a different lens, or a different one. film, it's all, it, it, it's different, 
okay? Uh, it creates a different image based on what that camera would produce. And then I want a picture of humans flourishing and smiling while collaborating, natural daytime light pouring in, talking to each other, doing creative problem solving in a large conference room setting, multi-generational, multi-ethnic diverse group of men and women make up this leadership team. The reason why all of that's necessary is because in mid-journey, if you don't say diverse group, it's mostly white people. And even if you put, give me a troll, it'll be the prettiest troll you want. So it's white and hot. That's, so, that's the- I have a question. That's the default, go ahead. So then, there's no copyright right on an image because it's machine generated. Is that correct? But if you do it in like the style of Banksy, what, what's the copyright like can I, on that? Like if it's in a certain artist style. Yeah, it's a style of, and it could be Renoir or Rembrandt or you know, pick it. It's a style of. So you actually can, I can copyright that image. It is not a, considered today to be a copyright, or, I don't know where that question's coming from. To, um, a library again? I'm right here. Yeah. Jeez. So it's a co it's a copyrighted. This this again will be in in uh, responsible AI. But the um, it is not considered to be a copyright violation. There have been exceptions, like Sarah Silverman sued OpenAI and Microsoft. All of those companies, Midjourney, uh, Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI, for what it's worth, have indemnified all of their customers. There are definitely issues that I could create a picture of the minions from Despicable Me, and it would do it, or the Simpsons, or whatever. There are definitely issues they have to work through. Um, doing something in the style of another artist, like Monet, it's gonna be in an impressionist style, right? I'm not saying give me the, the nymphias, the lily pads, in the style of Monet, et cetera. But none of that constitutes a copyright violation today, for what it's worth. However, any image you generate leveraging digital tools, AI tools like this, you can copyright, okay? You won't get it to produce a, a perfect logo of a known brand, for instance. You can't put the Coca-Cola logo on it. It has guardrails, too. It should, it will have, I'm sure, at some point, like it's not gonna be able to do the Simpsons or whatever. Any other questions about image generation? No. Or, so, so go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I've got a slide on all the tools we use every day for video creation and audio and voiceovers, and so forth. Langu language translation, leveraging voice. Did I answer your question on creativity? So for me, when I when I'm specifying more about what I'm looking for and then putting it into something that I'm getting value from or using it for, for a customer, I, I think that's more creative. When I'm iterating on that, saying that's not quite it, I need four more images. Like for instance, to get, not that one, but when there's a long phrase that is spelled properly, it takes me 200 images to get it. And I'm tweaking along the way, so it's more of a creative editing rather than you know, creating the picture myself or the painting or whatever the case may be. Uh, use my imagination. I would argue that you can use ChatGPT to change brainstorming forever and give you a start, spark the creativity by saying, you know, give me 20 ideas on ways I'm an English teacher, I'm a dual language teacher, I'm a librarian, give me 20 ways that I can use this tool to add value in my career, things like that. I don't think, personally, like in my workflows, and we all have to make decisions about what we wanna keep and what we're willing to give up, I don't need to sit in a room with six other people and work on a whiteboard to come up with 20 ideas. I'd rather start with 20 or 50 or 500 ideas, but let's say 20 ideas, and then figure out which ones are good and go from there. Because it, otherwise it just, it, it, it feels like a little bit of a waste of time and takes too long. You can get tunneled in, et cetera. And as you're working through frameworks like empathy mapping and design thinking, there are some elements that take so long if you do it yourself, 
but you can get a first draft out of it. And now that group of four people working on that empathy map can say, that's not true, let's tweak this one, that one's perfect, and so forth, and think critically about it. Any more questions? We're going to break in about 15 minutes. Um, I've got more to share with you. So this is image generation. After the break, I'll have to get, I'll have to see if I can log in, but after the break, I'll show you a music generator as well. Uh, and actually, my next slide starts responsible AI. So um, are there any other questions? That, how many of you feel, the ask was for everybody to have a device, but, and you, you haven't had the benefit of that. But if this guide were with you, how many of you would feel comfortable that you don't have to be technical to create a prompt using an AI tool today? Okay. So we know you don't have to be technical. And then let me just tell you this. When, as you get into using these tools, you're going to read a lot, hear a lot, see a lot about prompt engineering, writing the perfect prompt, and so forth. Two things to share with you about that. One is the prompt is just that. It's just to get the conversation started in the right way. After that, it's just a conversation. So now you're just chatting back and forth. You don't have to keep prompting it. You prompt it the first time. Like what I had up on the screen, this long prompt, it, you might, in a free tool, you might have to break this up because it's not necessarily going to want all of this in one prompt. But in ChatGPT4, like I said, you could put 700,000 words into Google for a context window. It can definitely handle this. There's some parentheticals to fill in. This is about how to increase custom, customer, the value of customer experiences in a business, OK? Y you can definitely put all of that into one prompt, or you can take each color separately and just work through it step by step yourself. But once you've prompted it to get a particular result, knowing what its role is, knowing what the objective is, which is the result you're looking for, and giving it the context that you've given it, you're really just now having a conversation with a brilliant coworker who doesn't work with you in the office but is available via text. Yes. Almost. I'm courteous every time. Yeah, um, at the outset, and then maybe one more time. If it's a super long thing that I'm working on, I'm going to be working for a few hours, I'll do that a couple of times. If it gets off track, too. Like, sometimes it struggles, and sometimes there's no good reason for the struggle because I've seen it do that before or something like it. So you can encourage it. Sometimes it'll just come back to you, especially the free version. It'll come back to you and say, I'm not capable of doing that, or whatever the actual phrase is. You can actually say, no, yes, you are. I believe in you. And then, it, and then sometimes it'll go, no, 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 I'm really not. And sometimes it'll just do it. Go ahead. I think it's any large language model. Yeah. I've used... Uh, Google Bard, but not Gemini, which is the most recent one, uh, in the same way. I've used Claude the same way. I know somebody who exclusively uses Claude every day, another large language model, and they treat it the same way. Yeah, there are some weird things in the system code. Every once in a while, I see a tweet about stuff like that. Like, um, some people would say over the last six months, it's gotten lazier. Right? And there's actually like limitations. Somebody published a system code. I don't know if it's real. Not all of it, but like a screen grab. I don't know if it's real or not, that, that post. But it essentially said if they ask for more than 10 examples, only give them 10 and tell them that's enough. Right? That kind of thing. So, so it, they're coding um, 
laziness into it. They're coding empathy into it. They're doing things like that. And again, like it's not the GPT model, it's the Lambda model, um, but it was 70, deemed 70% 70 more empathetic than a doctor in patient communication, right? So certainly capable of at least simulating that capability. So anything else on these pieces? Yes. So my 13-year-old uses it uh, at least half the time it's guided or supervised. Um, at what age are they using it without telling anybody? I don't know the answer to your question. At what age are they starting to use these tools that are baked into the browsers, right? They can get to it in Bing. They can get to it in Google. They can get to it in whatever the other browsers are that they're edge. Uh, Microsoft Edge and Chrome. It's in, er it's in every browser now. It's in uh, Microsoft Office. It's in Google's suite. So if it's there and they start using it on their own, I think that's an answer that they need to learn how to use it properly. I, I haven't... I don't know of anybody who's given guidance on Here's when it makes sense to start proactively teaching a four-year-old to use uh, AI. Um, and in the Human Skills Project, uh, we are specifically building, we call them 21-day journeys, but there's applied learning as it relates to like critical thinking and emotional intelligence and the other skills that you saw in the matrix. And we're building exercises to help people build those skills. Um, we definitely have freshmen in high school using that, uh, using AI tools in that context. Um, so my eighth grader, would I let her run? I will say, like, we failed with, in, with Instagram, and she doesn't have TikTok, but we failed with social media with all three of our children. Um, and... I don't want to make the same mistake with AI. I think that's right. But I also think we need to aim higher than we did with social media. Because we didn't know, and now we know. Now we know. And this is, in my mind, so much more powerful than anything we've experienced, even the tragedies related to Instagram and the body shaming and the suicides and all the awful things that have happened in that context of social media, I think this is worse or uh, has greater risk associated with it, I should say. It's more severe. So whether they're a student or one of your children, if they are using these tools on their own without learning how to use them properly and the importance of doing so, this conversation usually stops at eight tips on how to do a prompt. That is not the equation that we need to concern ourselves with. This has to do with how you interact with technology in a way that humanity has never had to do so before. And we know from previous industrial revolutions that there is an opportunity for human flourishing from technology as we evolve with the technology. And that's the opportunity. It's a very broad spectrum of opportunity and risk. Hello. I have a, I asked Chat GPT about lunch. <laughs> Where can we have lunch in Laredo under one hour? But you'll have till 1.30, okay? There are several options for a quick lunch in Laredo. Some popular choices include fast food chains like McDonald's, Subway, or Taco Bell. Or you could try a local restaurant that offers quick service, like a sandwich shop or a taqueria. It depends on your preferences and what you're in the mood for. So what do you all think? All right. So Todd? Shall we dismiss them? Okay. 
So let's get back around one, please, so that uh, we can get going with the other session. We do have Chromebooks over there in the back in case you want to check one out. We do have Chromebooks. If you're back before 1 o'clock and you've never used these tools, I'm happy to spend time with you really going through some examples from your perspective. Okay, so I'll be here. And I'm happy to do that after our next session as well. Before we get into responsible AI, I wanted to share, uh, I've been reflecting on the morning session and just thinking about a couple of gaps. Somebody asked me about, will we get a list of tools? And I'll make all these slides available to um, the folks at the district so that you have access to them. I'll just set up a Dropbox and make sure you get a link. Um, these are the tools we use and those that we've circled in yellow, uh, we use every day. Uh, to produce video, and um, Eleven Labs produces voiceovers. So if you think about creating content, learning content for the classroom, you can, um, with, with HeyGen, yeah, I've got a HeyGen in there. I haven't used this extensively yet, but you can actually record about a two-minute video of yourself, and then you can just write scripts, and it's you on video with great lip-syncing in your voice. Um, delivering the content, recorded content. So if you're, in, if you're going flip classroom or whatever the case may be, it's highly scalable and it will translate it into any language, uh, 39, one of 39 languages, but the ones that matter. And not only will it translate the voice, but it will alter your lip movement so that it looks like you're speaking that language natively. So. That's ridiculous, and that's called HeyGen. It's not inexpensive, but it's kind of fun. I showed you Sora, which is not on this list because it's not out yet. Runway and Pika Labs are very similar to Sora, but, but less capable, I would say, than what they demoed at least yesterday. Pictory we use to build videos, so our process for building a certain like faceless video learning content is we write the script, we leverage uh, one of the tools to do that, maybe GPT, maybe um, Claude, something like that. And then they um, put that into 11 labs, which can be your voice, or really there's hundreds of voices. So if you want it to be Scarlett Johansson uh, delivering your, your learning content in Spanish, she can do that, um, or it can do that. But it's not Scarlett Johansson, it's, it's, there's not a, Oh, the librarians are gone. Uh, there's not a copyright issue. It's not Scarlett Johansson. It's a simulated voice. Um, and then once they have the audio file and the script, they upload those to Pictory. And Pictory is an AI tool that takes that audio and script, and it automatically it just uses AI to, to choose video clips for like the background of, uh, of you know, as you're watching these videos. Um, and then we do do some editing of those clips so that we have our, you know, the point, the point in, like if we're doing something on growth mindset, we plug a video of Carol Dweck in, uh, who wrote the book Mindset and is the godmother of uh, growth mindset. Midjourney, I showed you the images that I created. It's incredible. Everything you saw was photorealistic, but you can create these ornate images. It's unbelievable for creative thinking just in terms of design and so forth. Uh, Suno, I'll come back to in just a second. Perplexity is the research AI. That I have a subs all of these are subscriptions, sadly. Um, perplexity is better supposedly at research than ChatGPT. Otter AI, and now we use Zoom, uh, Zoom Smart Assistant to transcribe. Uh, Otter transcribes, Zoom AI summarizes meetings. GitHub Copilot's all about coding. I don't do that, but others in our group do. Suno's a music app. So I'm sure some of you have seen like the mashups of music that still takes some audio engineering and music production talent. I have an embarrassing story that um, in our family, we, we have six kids, Irish Catholic family, and um, we 
compete against each other at holidays and gatherings in the kitchen. So, you know, whether it's desserts or whatever, we're always competing. However, on Christmas, everything is home-baked except I go to Arby's to get the roast beef, which is not anything I want you to share, but um, especially with my sister. But the, um, while I was standing in line at Arby's waiting for my three pounds of roast beef this year, I wrote a little country song about Arby's for Christmas. And we'll see if the audio kicks in. Oh, do I not have audio out off my laptop? Oh. All right, ready? Sorry. Sitting by the fire, strumming on my old guitar, thinking about the Christmas feast. That's not quite up to par. Mama's in the kitchen, cooking up a family tradition. Something's missing. I can feel the contradiction. Oh, the roast beef from our beach, it ain't homemade. The biscuits in the oven. Okay, so it's just a silly thing. But it took 30 seconds, and all I wrote was a sad country and western song on the guitar about the fact that the family Christmas roast beef is from Arby's. And then it created multiple songs and that was a good one. It's just a fun kind of amateurish tool, but it's another creative outlet and so forth. So, um, so that's called Suno, S-U-N-O. Um, so those are the tools that I use uh, regularly. I haven't created a song since my hit at Arby's, so uh, I don't use that often, uh, very often at all. The other thing I wanted to make sure to cover is I mentioned um, decision making later this year with GPT-5, if it's released this year, which it's expected to be, um, with uh, causal AI and neuromorphic AI. The only other AI that's coming that I want to share with you is, it's here already, um, they're called autonomous agents. And uh, you can read, you can Google autonomous agents or um, swarms. There's something called robotic process automation, which uh, my example would be in HR, if you get hired, there might be 52 tasks, administrative tasks to actually get you into the company payroll, into the system, all that stuff, the onboarding process, all of that, right? Like 40 of those steps can be automated just using, no AI, just using something called RPA, robotic process automation, and it just does tasks. When you combine that with that function of uh, an agent or aut autonomy with AI, it's called an autonomous agent. And the thought is we will all have uh, tens of agents. And I don't know if you ever saw the video of the CEO of Google like making an appointment at a hair salon or uh, demonstrating that or a Chinese restaurant and so forth. But that's the kind of stuff that's coming this year where um, you won't make reservations anymore. You'll just have the, your agent do that for you. And it will all be task oriented. And we'll all have sort of tens of help, virtual helpers, whatever, we, whatever use case. And that will be another app store like thing where you just download the agent and now it takes care of those things for you. It, it populates your schedule. It calls the it calls the restaurant and has a full conversation on your behalf to make the reservation and so forth. So autonomous agents is that term, and it's, it's definitely going to have an impact on the way we work. OK, I want to shift over to responsible AI, and I want to make this an interactive discussion um, rather than just standing up here and, and talking about it. You've already heard from me that I believe our most significant threat is around these types of issues, these paradoxes. And I was just sharing during the break that um, there's a company that I work with where uh, their head of clinical, they're in the assisted living space, their head of clinical, she answers similar types of questions 
like 20% of her week is spent asking, answering internal questions. And so they're building this chat bot called Ask Liz, um, which will automate that, and it will take that off her plate. And she wants it to be off her plate. And their term for that is now Liz can spend more time, 20% of her week, which is probably um, at least 10 hours, maybe 12 or 14 hours a week, working at the top of her license is their term for it. Okay? But that speaks to like human potential and you know, spending our day working on things that are of higher value. And that's kind of one of the promises that AI optimists talk about is, oh, well, we can let all that stuff go and we can just work over here on the bigger issues that add more value and so forth. But let me just suggest that not all of us want to. Right? Some of us like going to work from 9 to 5 or less than that and not being switched on all day long. And you know, I mentioned Kahneman before with critical thinking versus using intuition and heuristics. Remember that his research in the 70s, it talked about you know, our brains are, are wired to be very efficient. So it would be exhausting to just do critical thinking all day long. That's what the research actually says. That's system one, thinking fast, and system two, thinking slow. System two is like 10% of your day. System one is all the automatic stuff. Well, the CEO of IBM just said, hey, all that stuff down here is going away. We're automating all of that. So you're going to have to work up here. But the science says that that's exhausting. So think about burnout. Think about the fact that many of us look forward to an hour meeting where we don't have to say much because it's a little downtime during the day or whatever the case may be. Not everybody wants to work up here all day long every day or is capable of doing so and so forth. And so it's just a, it, these are the human things that we have to think about when we hear the promise of the technology in terms of what the response will be. And I see it as part of responsible AI, is that we have to uh, think through what the impact of these things will be so we have a lot more of this going on. These are the promises. But it could end up this way if we leave young people, old people, whatever, if we leave human beings to their own devices on these things, like we did social media, it can go very wrong. We're not, we don't all have the same level of motivation, the same level of you know, need to be recognized or need to achieve and so forth. And we just have to keep that in mind every time we see one of those promises of well, we can fulfill our human potential. Some of us think like we're doing that already. We're in a comfort zone. And it's going to be really hard. Forget about change management. It's going to be really hard to convince people that they have to work outside of their comfort zone for the rest of their career. OK. Let's just rip off the Band-Aid on academic integrity. So this is our framework, and again, I'll, I'll deliver this slide to you. Um, but essentially, I have a bias that a lot of institutions in the US call this, academic, this policy academic dishonesty, which is incredible to me. We, we don't want to put ourselves in a position of having to catch students doing bad things. We'd much rather build human competencies like integrity which are values-based and so forth. And so this is the, um, the framework about how you can work with students. And this is how, I may have killed the wrong uh, slide. So I'll stay here for a second. Um, I'm going to add a slide back in that shouldn't have come out that uh, is a guide for how you can talk to students about each of these points as well. Okay? So, for instance, when I'm certain I've got it on the other slide here. Oh, 
uh, yeah, academic integrity. I've got it on the responsible AI pieces like this one. So for instance, uh, you know, consider how your personal values should guide your interaction with AI. For instance, if honesty is important to you, and we hope that it is, think about how that affects the way you use AI to complete your homework. Those kinds of things, OK? Um, make sure your use of AI aligns with positive goals. Now remember these paradoxes, because that's the overarching point here, is we, we have to prepare young people and adult learners and everybody else, but given the audience here, we have to prepare young people to want to build these human competencies, because if they don't, they, it's just going to be a significant issue for them for their, during their lives. They really have to build critical thinking it's more important than ever. Here's why. This is why I refer to it as human skills instead of soft skills and hard skills. Because the machines are becoming so capable at, at simulating or looking like it's doing all of these things. And soon it will, it will continue to, it's just going to continue to grow in capability at a pace that none of us can fathom. We certainly can't keep up with it. It's far more efficient at learning than we are the technology is. And we have to protect the competencies that differentiate us from machines. Or there's, it, this will be a decision that employers will make, organizations will make in terms of, is that a human task or can that be done through automation? And history tells us that what can be automated will be automated. And if we're putting kids into either college, giving the dual enrollment teachers that are here, or into the workforce without these human competencies, it will be a significant failure in terms of our, their readiness to go to work in a meaningful way. And now you're talking about the paradoxes in that pitfalls column, in the risk column. Because I forget. The, the children and the, the young students that you're dealing with for a moment, be you for just a moment. I was shocked when the vast majority of people were still standing at 50%. Okay, I'm not sure what that says about teaching, but okay. Um, most people, when I have this conversation with audiences where they're working in industry, different industries. It's extraordinarily uncomfortable if you're in your 40s or 50s and you've been building these skill sets and now those tasks get automated or you're telling me I have to rely on collaborating with an AI in order to keep pace with the people that I either am working with or competing against or both. And the biggest risk that we have with regard to not building these competencies is around a loss of a sense of purpose or a loss of agency. And they're incredibly important issues from a societal perspective. That's what we have to protect. And every day and week and month and semester and year that go by where we're letting people use these tools and the technology companies are simply publishing ways to build prompts, we're not teaching them the things they really need to know which is how to have human-first AI. And so it's up to every one of us to help them understand the severe consequences in their career, in their ability to work continuously, in their, the need to be a, more adaptable than we can even think about in our career path. I had a couple of conversations this morning about people who are highly adaptive, but it's not natural to just keep moving and keep moving and keep learning and keep building a new skill. You know, how long have we been talking about lifelong learning and upskilling? A long time. But skills-based hiring is like less than 1% of the hires that are made right now. And it, we're not doing this systemically. We're, it's not being done at the scale that needs to be done. And so we have to help people understand the young people that we're charged with teaching we have to help them understand the severity of this issue. OK. So what I would love to do is 
you're sort of clustered up, but maybe in groups of four or six people. I just want to talk through three questions. So for the next five minutes or so, just get, get together uh, with a group of four to six and choose one of the top two questions. Either what scenarios in our digital age can blur the lines between collaboration and academic dishonesty? Because I'm standing up here saying I collaborate with AI, right? And you might be thinking, to what extent, you know, show me the work, right? What equals academic dishonesty or lack of academic integrity? And what is collaboration and what's OK? So that's the first question. And then how does maintaining academic integrity prepare students for real world ethical dilemmas? Because Integrity transcends high school and college, right? We need professional integrity, too. We need people who are capable of doing high level of, a high level of work without being overly reliant on AI systems, autonomous agents, quantum compute, and whatever else is coming down the stream. So please just choose one of those two questions, talk within your group, and then I'll, I'm just going to walk around with a microphone and ask you for your input rather than just asking for volunteers now. So you've got five minutes, and then we'll, we'll do a quick ask of the crowd, of the group. One, just one of the top two questions. OK. Apologies for the short turnaround. We're going to do a bunch of this over the next hour or so, and so I just want to keep us moving. Uh, who has got some thoughts that came out of the conversation? Hands shot up. All right, we chose the second one. How does maintaining academic integrity prepare students for real life or real world ethical? dilemmas in the workplace. Well, first of all, they are going to have to take a state mandated test for whatever they decide to become. And so they're not going to have the AI to help them there. Mm -hmm. So they have to learn. And they can use this as a tool, but not rely on it, yes. totally depend on it, because they are going to have to take the test without the help of AI. Yep. OK. Any other thoughts on that? What do you think? Any feedback for this group, too? Anybody? Yes. So I know one of the things that you guys should know over here was when you were talking about the, the pictures that you can make through the AI, about, uh, because we're math teachers, getting those more complicated word problems and being able to have the AI create an image for the more visual type learners in our class so that they can understand how they can themselves start creating a visual aspect of the word problems, especially like, you know, talking about the star test and stuff like that. Well, yeah, they're not going to have the AI to be able to do it, but if they can at least try and train themselves to start seeing these word problems in a visual manner, maybe it can correlate to them being able to do it on their own. Hmm. Okay. Uh, this group had some input. Wasn't the same answer, was it? Okay. Our oh, first question. All right. Yep. Go. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, with first the first questions for the accelerated yeah. group. This is the harder one. <laughs> yeah. With respect to the <laughs> academic dishonesty and uh, all of that, we th Thanks. we thought it was really interesting how um, you were recommending that we embrace the AI because, like, the AI checkers don't really work consistently. Yep. Um, especially with someone that's interfacing well with the AI and having the conversations, like you said. So that's something that we hadn't really thought about, but our first reaction is, OK, nobody tell the students <laughs> yeah. that we can't tell. Uh, but secondly, um, being, able to, being able to prepare ourselves, our students, well for the workplace, um, the, if you're working in the private sector, they're not going to care what amount of AI you leverage to produce a result. They're expecting you to produce a, produce a result and produce a product. And so we need to go into our education of the students with the mindset of like, like you were saying earlier, um, what values do they want to have? And one of those values that we think is important is um, being able to 
being, being, able to, being able to use your own faculties to evaluate whether something's good or bad and being able to produce something yourself. And so, like you were saying earlier, um, in, sh in the short term, the creative aspect is augmented right away, but in the long term, you might be able to, you might lose some of your creative faculties. So yeah. like having some self value and trying to like retain that as you interface with AI is gonna be something we want our students to, to really um, take in. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, it's gonna come up on a future slide around, you know, build those competencies, right? You gotta keep building competencies. That's the point. You know, I, I recognize that it feels a little disconnected when you go from AI to what's going to change with work and so forth. They're so hyper-connected. So when you think about the skills-based economy and the need to coexist with AI, you have to keep building skills. So this is not the story that we've been telling students for the last 10 years about lifelong learning. This is more about, no, no, no. Like, Every couple of years, you're going to have to get some form of new credential. It could be a four-week program certificate. It doesn't matter. You're going to have to keep building skills so that you can become more valuable to your employer, your client, et cetera, because that's how they're going to start plugging you into work. OK, um, let's move to the second group, unless somebody's got one last burning thing they want to say. OK. So let's move to the second group and do the same thing, just for the next five minutes. In what ways do you think students should leverage AI to assist with their learning without compromising integrity? And maybe some of you will decide, well, they just shouldn't. By the way, I wanted to mention with regard to AI checkers, I have a friend who's a superintendent, and there's 75,000 high school students in that district. And I said, you know, I mean, you know they don't work, right? And he said, well, they think they do. So that'll be a short-term solution, but, but um, not a good long-term. Um, or how can we ensure students understand the difference between using AI as a tool for learning versus using it to bypass learning? So choose one within that same group, the same group you're working with. We'll go for five minutes, and then we'll do the same thing. Okay, so before we start doing this readout, who among us has recognized a significant flaw in the image on the screen? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, it's a halftime celebration. I spent nine years as an NBA mascot. There have been a lot more people on the court. The Bucks, Milwaukee Bucks, Giannis. It wasn't during the Giannis era. <laughs> okay, so there's a little extra sort of half of an I without the dot next to the R. It took me 180 images to get to this one. And, and you know, we live in the era of good enough, but uh, it's, just, it's interesting. It, like video, when, when uh, YouTube and TikTok were getting going and so forth, it was, well, it'll never be like video production. It's never going to be like that. But that's not the era that we live in anymore, right? So I'm wondering how long it's going to take for this to be acceptable. Instead, the capability of the software has, has gotten so much better so fast. It, it, six months ago, that would have been written in Sanskrit or something. You would have not been able to read a, a Latin character in it. Now it's really close, and it's getting better and better. So anyway, I, <laughs> I just wondered if anybody had picked that out. OK, who has got feedback on the second group of questions around AI and academic work? Who's got some thoughts from their group? Discussion. Credit over here. Pulling up. Okay. Uh, regarding the second question specifically, how can we ensure students understand the difference between using AI as a tool for learning versus using it to bypass learning? We think that's something that would be really difficult to police. Um, checking every single student, like, are you taking the shortcuts, or are you uh, just to just to get by and get the grades? Or are you really like trying to supplement the way that you're getting your knowledge and like really trying to internalize uh, whatever the lessons happen to be for that class? 
Um, and kind of upon reflection of that, we know that we can have discussion and we can speak with students and try to instill the, the character traits and values that support, I want to learn, I want to actually um, internalize whatever it is that the teacher is trying to explain to me. Um, and that, that can definitely help, because that's something that all of us do um, you know, as mentors uh, to our students. But something that would help a lot is if uh, systems weren't stacked against us, because a lot of times students care about grades more than they care about learning. And they want to make sure they have the GPA so they can get into different universities that they want to go to and things like that. And they want to have different feathers in their cap uh, in terms of their academic metrics. So something that is way out of our hands here um, that would be awesome is if instead of getting a grade in a class, um, you had some sort of keystone project, something that you produced in that course. So maybe it's like, in this class, we're going to um, invent an app. Each person's going to come up with an app. In this class, we're going to produce some literature. In this class, we're going to do an analysis of what this uh, think tank uh, reported and, and see if we think these are some valid like foreign policy initiatives and things like that. So like, if that's what we did in each class, you know, we're building up to that with many projects, and then at the end, we've got something that we can put into a portfolio. Um, that would be something that could really help uh, students stand out when universities are looking at them. Um, so one of the classes I teach is SAT prep, and so that class is, you're just preparing for the SAT. Let's get a higher score on paper. But something else that the prep teachers uh, can and, and definitely do is talk about why, are we, uh, why do we want a higher SAT score? Because we want to get into a university. Why do we bother going to a university? Because we want to get into a particular field or career that um, ignites our passion, something that we actually want to do. So that's something that the SAT and uh, other prep teachers talk about with their students is uh, what do you personally want to do? What do you want to get into? Why do you want to go to a particular university? Um, and always, the kids always say, I want to go to an Ivy League school. I want to go to Yale, Harvard, Princeton, or another school equally prestigious like Stanford or something like that. And those schools have a 4% acceptance rate. So 25 kids apply, one kid gets in, and all 25 of them are stacked because the lower kids aren't applying. So how are you going to distinguish yourself? I have an amazing GPA. I participate in after-school activities. I've done a ton of community service. And still those kids don't get accepted um, in some cases. So how do you make yourself stand out? You've already produced something. You've already collaborated with a professor on research, or you've invented an app, or you've you have something in your portfolio, like you founded a community service organization um, in your town. Something along those lines that really make you glow and stand out. And it would be awesome if uh, that was like what we were doing in each of our classes. So I think uh, AI um, is ripe for project-based learning. Um, you mentioned a couple of universities. Harvard and Stanford this past semester both had classes that were taught by AI and required the use of ChatGPT, the intro to uh, CS50, it's called the intro to computer science at Harvard. And there were three or four classes um, at Stanford that went the same route. And it was all about collaborative projects throughout the semester. Um, so it feels like there's at least some movement in that direction from the higher ed perspective. Really love the input from this group. And who else has got something that they want to share with regard to one of these two questions? I just wanted to add to the second question what it says. How can you ensure students understand the difference between using AI as a tool for learning versus using it to bypass learning? I think as a teacher, the only thing that we can do is, as role models, model it so they can know when to use it, how to use it, and so they can, uh, I'm going to steal this from you, so they don't uh, get a dependency on this. And <laughs> that's the only way that we can ensure our students can be um, get those skills that they're going to need for to go to any university, but they need to know everything, even if it is something that we know they might not use it correctly. Our job as a teacher, as an educator, is to show them how to do it right, even use it. Even myself, I teach my students, yes, let me show you how to do this, and then let's use this one as well, but this is how you use it, this is when you're going to use it. I think that's that's yeah, what, the I, best we can do for them. 
I hope, I'll certainly send my keynote slides as well, but this human AI partnership piece, those are the components. That's the framework around AI agility. This is the framework around how, what the dynamics are of that relationship between the student or employee and AI. In, there are, um, in the corporate space, when we work with teams, um, they have digital free zones where, okay, so for this effort that we're doing in some form of a collaboration, could be brainstorming or ideation, innovation, whatever the situation is, they're in a conference room and say, okay, this time, no AI. This is a digital free zone this time. How big of a difference does that make? Would it make it a lot harder and so forth? Did we exercise some things we haven't exercised in a little while, things of that nature? In academia, in high schools and higher ed, there are um, people, there are people worth following online. They, they can be a little irritating. Um, uh, I say that with pure humility because I know I can be too. Um, but uh, Jason Goodlia is an English professor at uh, Berkeley College and an AI advocate. Um, he structures, he publishes assignments sometimes on LinkedIn, at least. I don't know what other platforms he's on, where um, he structures them so AI is required, but you will show me your, all of your prompts. So before we punish somebody for using AI, let's at least make sure, I want to see the prompts that you use. Did you do any work? Did you do the critical thinking? It can actually be more effective to do some of that critical thinking in the iterative process of creating this work. But if it's filled with all of this language that is clearly AI written and you didn't do any of that critical thinking, now we have an issue that we have to solve. But instead, we can teach people these, for, these elements of the human AI partnership and have them working that way. There are other people like Ethan Mollick at the University of Pennsylvania. He's probably at the top at this point. Um, and Connor Grennan, who's dean of MBA students at NYU. They're out in front with, um, with AI. Uh, in the classroom. Uh, more oral presentations, re restructuring assignments so that AI is okay, but I just want to see your process. I want to see your critical thinking. I'll show you mine. I'll, I'll show you my lesson plan, my AI, my use of AI for the lesson plan. Let me show you how I worked with the AI throughout to create this critical thinking process where I actually spent a little more time on it, right? But it's better work coming from me, that's what I expect from you, too. I think I really love the point about modeling that behavior. So that is the application from which our dad likes to say, you need to do this in order to produce it. Because they can come back and say, you gave me this tool to use, and now you're punishing me for it. So we have to incorporate our own dad likes to say, but you need to do all of this to right. produce this. That's right. Yeah, so that's what's known as AI alignment, uh, values alignment, incentive alignment. I need that grade. I need that gratification of having that done. You know, I have a job. I'm a senior in high school. I have a job. I play a sport. I didn't have time. I knocked it. I got it done. I submitted it on time. They're going to look for the easy way out. And, and of course they are. Always. Right. And so we have to be in front of that because they're going to use it without any of the guidance. Do I want to read the whole book or read Spark Notes? Do I want to um, write original thought or go online and plagiarize you know, more recently, right? I think in the long run, you know, the more this gets integrated into our children's lives, the more they're going to be able to use it in the future. Yeah. These are the paradoxes for which there are ramifications, right? This can either be an incredible tool that can help you succeed, help you live a fuller life, work at a higher level, 
I think about it myself. So if I can use a tool and in essentially the same amount of time, maybe spend a little more time, if I'm being honest, especially when you create a 180 scoreboard images for academic integrity, maybe that's not the best use of my time. But if I spend more time on something, but the work is 40% better or 17% better, according to the data, right? And that's only going to continue to increase because I am building skills that I didn't necessarily exercise prior to it, just because of my process. You have to help them, just like in the workplace when we're working with teams, we have to help people develop a workflow. Where do you plug this technology in? What, what, are the, what are the guardrails for the AI? What are the guardrails for the student? I want to be really clear about that. Let me help you understand all of the ways you can work with an AI in a healthy way. Let me help you understand the ramifications if you go down this path and get caught. It's not worth it. But it can be incredibly beneficial for you if you use it the right way. That depends on how iterative that process is, right? And what does your prompt look like? It depends on those. So not entirely true, at least in my process, there's a lot of me in the context, right? Because I built that matrix of human skills with other people, but without any AI, right? And I have all of the research on what this skill looks like and what this mindset looks like, and I'm honing AI to learn that from me, okay? And when we're working on something that I'm not an expert in, Consider the workplace ramifications of not having access to the tool, right? So what the best we can hope for at this point is the ability to work with AI to create a higher level of work, a product. Because I showed you the, the gap closing, which is great if you're from, you know, in that bottom half of performers, baseline, and so forth, it's the field leveler. But now, the natural intelligence, the natural ability, and the education, and everything else that I have is less meaningful in that world because somebody who doesn't have all of that can leverage AI and do the work that I'm doing. Now, I will tell you that I can produce a better product on something that I'm an expert in than you can, and you can do the same. Right? You, your, I'm sorry? Yeah, you say take credit. Okay. Yeah, but I think the new norm is I created it with AI. And that, that may have a stigma today. But that's because you're used to, if you've ever used the tool, you're used to putting in an eight-word prompt and not working with it to shape it, not spending three hours on a task that would have taken two hours previously to make it better, not getting the external virtual perspective to broaden your own thoughts, not preparing for things with greater context than preparing for a test, for instance, with greater context than you would have normally gotten on your own. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, what if you said, write a letter of recommendation for one of my students, this is the name, and here are the four things that I want to make sure that we absolutely cover because this is what I believe about that person. If that's the context piece.
Yeah, remember all those pieces. Reflect on the knowledge that you have about this. Share that as part of the context. Collect more context. Feed. Like It's a collaborative creation process. It's the best practice around what is inevitable. If we don't teach that, they will say, write the paper about this book right. or whatever the case may be. Write this expository essay. Write this letter of recommendation. I'm saying there's a better way for that process. And I'm afraid something like, like the talk you were going to say. It was great, but now there's three hours of talking to me and an average. One divided by two. I think that's a big job. They're going to say, why did I say? Exactly. That's overuse and overdependency, and we've got to say no calculators. If we're doing one divided by two, put your calculator down. Yeah. So, no, of course. Is ChatGPT banned for students in the district today? No policy against it? Are Spark Notes banned? Uh, no. Yep. Yep. Yes. So these are the digital free zones, right? I can't, I, I have to teach high cognitive skills. I have to teach simple division of, of integers, right? Uh, yeah. To me, the idea, and I don't know if, well, I can't hear myself, so I don't know. But, it can, can, does it sound? but the idea is essentially this, right, in, in, in my eyes, right, is have you earned the right to use something like this? You just made the point, right, when you were right now, and, and rightfully so, when you were right now being asked by Mr. Science about going back and forth, and you said, I can assure you that if I'm an expert at the topic, I'm going to ultimately create a much better, much better paper, presentation, whatever, than you will because you've earned the right as an expert without that. So you already know where you're headed, you're this, you're that, you've done the hard work. And so uh, the idea, you know, going back to this calculators and math and so forth is, okay, yes, here's a calculator, use it, use it, use it for star, for this, for that, for whatever. And it's great until you don't have it. Until let's say, for example, they're taking the TSI exam and they don't have the option on a given problem to use a calculator, but they don't know how to add fractions yep. because they were using it on the calculator or we didn't force them to multiplications or whatever the case may be, right? So, and, and naturally so, I mean, if you get somebody and you tell them, here's a vehicle and this vehicle can drive itself, just walk in there, sit down, tell it where you want to go, you want to go to the mall, you want to go, whatever. It's all great until all of a sudden they don't have access to that vehicle and they need to drive, but they don't know how to drive. Yeah. I'm disappointed they, every time I get into the car with my son and he needs GPS because he doesn't know we, exactly. in the town he grew up in yes. how to get somewhere yes. or yes. read a map. Or yes. the, yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. But so, we don't remember telephone numbers anymore yeah. either. So it goes back us, to that right? idea. Have you actually earned the right to use this for purposes of efficiency, for purposes of... How are you intending to police whatever? that? I don't disagree with the thought. Yeah. And, and there's all kinds of prescri subs prescriptions where you can, uh, you can say, digital free zone, like we're going to be very explicit and intentional about thinking about critical thinking right now. We're building that skill and right, those sorts of things. But trying to police the use of AI when it is in every tool that they have access to on their computer is 
going to be incredibly difficult. And that's something that is very challenging for educators, right? Because a lot of the things that we might do, if we're putting together a project, for example, is not something that they're going to just quickly do it in class within one session, sure. whatever. We have to deal with timelines, prepping up for exams, state exams, college exams, et cetera. So sometimes we don't have the time to say, okay, let's really dig into this. Let me see your prompt. Let me see what you did here. Let me look at this and let me look at that. It's, it's almost like you got to go. There's certain topics you got to cover within a certain period of time. So, so, you know, at the end of the day, I guess for educators, we just got to deal with the fact that as everything is moving around us, changing, it comes towards us and somehow we got to figure out a way for the kids to still learn, even though, you know, education in a certain way is moved by technology, by entertainment. You already know, say, well, you know, learn the quadratic formula, but learn a rap song to learn the quadratic form like really yeah who i mean why do they have to learn a rap song or do a little video to be able to learn the quadratic formula yeah if for hundreds of years or whatnot that hasn't been the case so what's the difference now yeah. right and so oh well but it is yeah. what it is so i'm just suggesting that there's there's an alternative very few of you put your hand up in terms of have you used the technology you will not be able to teach people how to use the technology properly and responsibly until you use it yourself, until you become proficient in using it yourself. And I'm just suggesting to you that it's much deeper than writing a good prompt. The rest of that three-hour creation process, for me, is an iterative critical thinking process or creativity process or both. Okay? And so if you don't do that, they are going to use it either without you knowing or you'll certainly know, and they'll have to deal with the ramifications of that. But they're also ultimately going into a workforce where it is being demanded by their employers that they know how to use these tools. Yeah. Yeah, I graduate from college with a mathematics degree, and I go to work for an actuarial firm, and my boss walks by, and I'm you know, doing the long form on figuring out an problem, actuarial problem on my tablet, my, my paper tablet, right? And he sa or she says to me, why aren't you using a spreadsheet or a at least a calculator, <laughs> right? Maybe. And that is the challenge. Like they get their Chromebooks in at least third grade. And those Chromebooks. Right, so how early, that's the question from earlier and during the break. How early do we have to start embedding in people's minds the importance of leveraging it properly and not outsourcing your own competencies, but consistently build those competencies. Yep. Who is also using it? Yeah. Yep. And, th and that's why I'm saying this road is filled with paradoxes, right? And, they, and the consequences of getting it wrong or doing nothing, like I, I was saying earlier, I, we failed with all three of our children as it relates to social. Um, and there hasn't been a horrific incident or anything like that. There have been some raised eyebrows between my wife and I, like, <laughs> didn't know that was happening. We know we can't afford to do that with AI. 
Because even at 28 years of age, my oldest son, um, you know, he's, he's a very different, he was four years in a Buddhist monastery, he's got a psychology degree, etc. cetera. He's, he's very well grounded. He knows who he is. I know from using the tool every day with expertise in certain areas that I can fall victim to it. I just am beginning to build the capability of catching myself and saying, oh, that's, right? I outsourced that and I shouldn't have, or I should have given it more context from what I know and so forth. And what I'm putting on slides are roadmaps about how to potentially build process and workflow around how to use it so these things don't happen to people who either don't think they're doing anything wrong, to your point, or don't recognize that it's happening. Like me writing children's books for an hour and 45 minutes, maybe that should have stopped after seven minutes or something like that. Maybe I should have had the ability you know, at 1.30 in the morning to say, <laughs> or discipline. No, of course, yeah. No. <laughs> Uh, believe me, I do this three times a week. This is not, this is not the worst of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, um, so let me go back, because I'm hearing issues that are coming up that live here, right? So I know myself very well. I, I, um, at my age, I know, do you, do you know what an Irish goodbye is or Irish farewell, where you just kind of duck out of a party without saying goodbye to anybody? Um, I know that I'm perfectly capable of collapsing inward with myself, and today, I can easily justify that by saying, oh, I'm working. And, and I avoid social situations sometimes because of that. I don't think it started. <laughs> I would have had a different excuse. Um, but I don't think it started with this. But I definitely see the tendency to even collaborate at work differently. I, can, I have to build these disciplines, these muscles in myself at this point, even though I've lived you know, 25, 30 years, 30 plus, ugh, 30 plus years working with other people in a very collaborative way, having meetings, you know, and so forth. Now I'm doing this, and I, I have to build the skills to say, oh, I should be doing this with other people, or instead of bouncing it off my eight-person virtual panel, maybe I should ask my buddy next door, or whatever the case may be, right? And so I'm just suggesting that, like, I might be a... 30-year veteran in business and so forth, but I am one year old in AI. And I use it regularly, and I'm telling you, I have fallen uh, victim, for lack of a better term, to all of these issues. And they're big issues if they perpetuate in young people, or if that's the skill that they build, right? Or lack of. No, I was, I was just, I was just going to say, right, that yes, it, I mean, there's certain parts of it that are really good. Um, if I go ahead, a, a young person, right, for example, writes a paper that has to deal with finance, accounting, or whatnot, or this and that in an accounting class or whatnot, and then, and then puts it onto a so-called uh, make-believe panel of what would a banker, what would a CPA, what would a group of CPAs in Texas or whatever, yep. would, 
that'd be very good. That'd be very good because I'd much rather hear it from them, God willing, I'm hearing from something that's trustworthy, right, and not the neighbor that put sure. it together for AI. But I'd rather hear it from them that are more experts and more in the field and more in the workforce where I plan to go to, et cetera, et cetera, than to hear it from my peers that are a bunch of 16, 15, 16 of year course. old kids that are not likely to be able to criticize it much. They might think I'm doing a really good job, and yet when I put it to this panel, I realize there's a lot of things that I need to still think about. So yeah, there are certain things of it, uh, and the presentation has been really good, sir, and everything. I just, you know, it's just, uh, there you go. Hey, I, I very much enjoyed it. I, I have to tell you, like, this is nothing in terms of the, the concern and, and so forth. Like these are, this is the conversation that needs to be had, right? I was in um, Houston area, I won't be more specific than that, at an institution, and uh, we had uh, like 600 people in this workshop, and gave a microphone to the first person, he said, I want the equivalent of law and order in my classroom, stood up, you know, and I want to take their assignment, he was an English teacher, I want a professor, I want to take this assignment, and I want to plug it into a tool, a, a, an AI checker, and I want it to tell me with accuracy whether or not they used AI, and then I want to show them the rules and then show them the door. And I'm like, oh my God, this is gonna be a long 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the conversation that we need to have. We need to think through these paradoxes. We need to think through the downside, and we need to learn the tools too so that we can clearly communicate to young people what can really happen is really bad. Oh, I haven't seen it. Yes, of course. Sure. Okay, let's um, just given time, I want to be respectful of your time. Let's move on to the next set of responsible AI factors. So we, we talked about academic integrity. Um, we haven't really talked about these three, and then there are three more. We only have, I'm happy to stay as long as you like, um, but I think we're supposed to be done around 2.30, so I want to just, again, share with you that you will have access to this. As we think about ethical engagement and, and asking students to reflect on what their values are, uh, align with their purpose, consider the impact, social impact of this, and so forth. The number one issue on safe AI usage is build your competency. <clears throat> um, I've had coworkers say that should be the number one on this slide. I don't necessarily disagree, I just, I, I wanna start internally with ethics. The whole paradox slide is about build your competency. The whole human skills matrix is about building competencies that people are not only going to hire for, but they're going to assign work according to, and they're going to promote and um, incentivize and so forth based on these competencies. We have to help people understand, young people understand the consequences of not building these capabilities. The capabilities that are durable, that are uniquely human, that a machine cannot replicate, it cannot be automated, these relational skills, both high cognitive and socio-emotional skills. And so that just begs this issue. Yeah, till 3.30. Oh, 3.30. I thought it was Eastern, 3.30 Eastern, but I guess not. Thank you, Mario. Um, three words, not my fault. Um, well, now I can slow down. So, take a breath. Um, we, we'll, we'll do a break. Let's get through this one, this slide, and the questions related to it. We'll take a break, and we'll come back and do the last one. So, when I think about the requirement to um, understand 
Not necessarily by the time I graduate from high school, I don't need to understand what my sense of purpose is. I might need to understand um, that I might have a feeling about what that is today, but it will evolve consistently throughout my life, especially as I work in 17 different industries for an average of three years, which is what expected, is expected of the people in high school right now. Um, the, the need to have agency and autonomy and, that, and feeling of self-determination, not being subjected to the decisions that are being made by technologists. For some of us, working above the equator to unlock my own human potential, again, I, I think it's naive to think that all of us want to do that. But there are elements there around emotional intelligence, complex problem solving, mindfulness, not the meditation form necessarily, but being present in the moment. Learning across multiple disciplines. These kinds of skills and competencies are extraordinarily important, and we need to teach them. Uh, it, yes, in the flow of other classes, but we need to be very clear that this is what we're learning right now because these are the skills, again, that they'll need. And AI agility is one of those skills. It's the one we're talking about today. So you can imagine having these types of conversations over time with students about being aware of biases, about being in alignment with their values, really understanding more about who they are and what their relationship what a healthy relationship looks like with, what AI, with AI and what their relationship with AI is. And whether or not that's good or bad. Is it headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? Because it will be headed in a direction. It's the most accessible technology. It's far less expensive than a calculator was in the 70s. Okay, so let's have this conversation, again, you'll have all these slides, so you can, you'll have this framework. Um, but I'd like you to spend five minutes in your group talking about these two questions related to ethical engagement. How do you integrate ethics, especially AI or digital ethics, into your classroom? And then what are some of the effective strategies to help students reflect on their values? I don't think anybody ever asked me what my values were when I was a 17-year-old in high school. Um, my girlfriend's grandmother may have one time. But um, the, these are important considerations for us if we're going to get this right. We can't ha can just have the argument about why does this have to be different or resign ourselves to the fact that it's everywhere and students are using it, those we, that we know about, those that we don't know about. We have to be proactive in having these types of conversations in order to help them decide, at least consistently, if not always, to use the technology responsibly. So, uh, Let's go for five minutes on the two questions related to ethical engagement, and then we'll work through this slide, and then we'll take a break. OK, let's uh, quickly get a couple of people to give us input on the question related to ethical engagement with students. Any thoughts from the groups? article we read a while back about that lady from Full House that paid her kids into college. That was an ethical thing, and we were talking about how would that make you feel if you know that a student got into a very good Ivy League college strictly by using AI. That was it. Uh, just to build off of that, we were also saying, like, 
as far as how can we integrate a discussion, as far as Eng English teachers here, we were thinking you know, some type of debate or pros and cons, uh, and then you know, bringing up that article as far as, okay, this happened and these are the outcomes, this is what can possibly happen if you are using this and you get caught or somehow where they see what the consequences can be for using it in, in the wrong fashion. You know, if, if there's articles, if there's studies out there that show, okay, well, it can be used in this way to enhance your, your writing, um, but it can also be used in this way to, you know, possibly, like, like we said, the, the pitfalls and downfalls of those types of Anybody else? One more group? This just goes along with what we were saying earlier about this would be used better, I think, when we're doing guided practice and showing them how to lean on it and be inspired from it and then to be able to create from it. So if, for example, even when looking at art, if you have something that's created by AI, is it the same as an artist who's going to put maybe more emotion and feeling behind this piece? So I think it's just good to differentiate that in the guided practice. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's keep moving. We're going to do these two, two more sets of questions, and then we'll go to a break. Um, so in terms of safe AI usage, what are the best practices for teaching students about digital safety and privacy in the context of AI? And then how can we as educators stay informed about the latest developments in AI to ensure we're teaching students up-to-date information? Because like I said, a week ago, every day, every new chat session, there was no memory across those different chats. As of yesterday, there was, right? And that's, that changes workflow. It, it changes the way you interact with the AI because you don't have to set the baseline information every time. You can just refer to this thing. Remember when we were talking about this? Just like you would a human, right? A person that you're collaborating with. So talk about those couple of questions and then um, we'll come back together in five minutes. These, I'm going to, if you've got the questions, I'm going to put the sort of the principles back up here in terms of safe AI usage. Remember, build your competency is number one, prioritize safety, and report risks. Those are what the two questions are alluding to. So how do you encourage AI safety? What are the best practices for teaching them about it? And then how do you stay informed about these changes? So for instance, later this year when causal AI comes out and, it's be and AI is better at making decisions than 75% of the people in the workforce, it's in that top quartile, now what happens? How do you stay up to date with that capability so that you can guide them through that land you know, minefield. Okay, so let's get into the conversation around safe AI. Um, when it comes to making sure that people are still building competencies, and I, I want to be clear that while we're not covering it today with just two workshops, there's another AI agility principle um, called creating value, real value with AI. And then um, there's a piece around human first strategies or human centric strategies, if you will. And one of the concepts, one that you might be able to lean on is called human in the loop. We were just having this conversation. Companies today, they'll use AI for a lot of things, generative AI, especially internally. But when it comes to communicating directly with customers, there's, there's human oversight involved, right? And that, that workflow, is, um, that element is called human in the loop. And during the keynote, we talked about it's not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. So 
It's here to augment human capabilities, but it's human first. These are the kinds of principles that we have to continuously help people understand to reduce the risks that we're talking about. Who's got some thoughts about safe AI or AI safety? Anybody? What's that? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you for that. As I said before, 50% of AI researchers believe there's a greater than 10% chance that this is an existential uh, threat to our species. So, you know, would you get on an airplane if 50% of the people who build airplanes said there's a 10% chance the plane's going to go down? That's the, that's the question being floated by some of the AI safety folks or those, those types of individuals. Okay, well, let's, if there's no input on this piece, let's move on to bias recognition. And if we get three great responses, we'll take a break. <laughs> um, so uh, beyond... The, some of the um, risks that we talked about in terms of individuals overusing, becoming reliant, outsourcing, not building competencies, and so forth, there's this element of biases in the AI. Of course, they're there because they were built by humans, but I mentioned before, mid-journey, you have to be very specific, give it instructions, or it generally produces white, good-looking people, right, um, in the images. Um, these types of biases, actually, I would say ChatGPT does a nice job of, of the, probably going the other way on those kinds of issues um, related to bias. But it's still there. And so to stay aware and have strategies in place to mitigate and to make sure that we have at least, at a minimum, diversity of perspective in what we're working on, like the eight-person panel that reviews my slides. There are eight different personas from different educational backgrounds, different ethnicities, different generations. I assigned all of those things to create diverse perspectives from a simulated audience, okay? So think through this piece a little bit around biases and how important, how you might prioritize this against some of the things that we've already talked about, which feel a little more pressing as it relates to students becoming overly reliant on AI. But this is a piece that they're going to have to confront as they use these tools. Okay, so five minutes, three minute discussion, three one minute answers, and then we take a break. And after that, we've got like 20 minutes left. We're good. All right, so five minutes, please talk amongst yourselves. Okay, who's got Thoughts about, oh, hold on, group shot. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about these three principles as it relates to biases and inclusion uh, on perspectives. And the framing questions were these, but just feel free to speak with regard to um, the principles themselves. So, I don't know, I, again, I'm a writing teacher, so I'm coming from the, you know, composition classroom, the perspective of a composition classroom teacher. And so one thing that I've noticed, especially with AI, is that it's not yet trained to uh, fully understand the language that certain communities have. And so, for example, if I ask uh, the AI to tell me the meaning of the word "wero," it tells me, literally, it means blondie which 
is not necessarily true because in a Mexican community like Laredo, Güero has, um, it could be um, kind of like a term of endearment and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you, mean that you're a blonde person, right? And so I think that in the writing classroom, integrating AI is good for, in some aspects, but we gotta, we gotta stick to students writing for the sake of writing and then use AI as a way to support that instead of seeing AI as this like, this complete threat that's going to, you know, destroy the, the habit of writing. And again, tell the kids, well, notice how this AI isn't able to pick up your slang or the way that you guys communicate, um, especially to such a isolated community like Laredo, you know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, I think that's that's something that I picked up, and the way, if I tell it, integrate the word huero in a conversation between a person from Laredo and a person from L.A. or a Chicano from L.A., it pretty much sounds the same. It sounds like a Hollywood depiction of a Chicano, which is not really authentic. It's like, hey, what's up, huero? How have you been, y'all? And that's not how we saw sound, you know? That's not how Laredo people sound. So... Hmm. It's just something. So some of the cultural issues that are human, right? Okay, any other input? Thank you for that. We've got two of our three done. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the rest of the room now. So from the gifted lens, we always encourage our students to think critically. So I would want students to research at the inception what was actually behind creating AI with those gentlemen that you showed in the photograph. That would be one thing. Another thing I would want them to do is to follow the money. Who were the investors? And also to run prompts in different applications to see what different results they would get with the different mm -hmm. tools. Interesting. So if you follow the money, who do you think are the biggest companies? In Microsoft. The That's one. Who's next? Yeah. Um, yeah. Google. Who's next? Google, yeah. Meta? Yeah. Facebook? Uh, so, yeah, for them to be aware, you know, what the narratives are and just to question everything. Tesla, OpenAI. Thank you. One more. No pressure. <laughs> All right. Oh, she's got nothing. I have no good mics. I just give her the mic, she's great. I don't know what to say. Her. No, all, all I was going with was, you know, why do we always have to look at the biases? You know, it's like, you know, we made a comment about when we all had to make our emojis, and it started off with white. Well, that's just the base color. It doesn't have to mean that everybody has to be white. And so I guess I'm just frustrated with the whole, why are we always looking at the biases? Can we just not look at what's there, think critically, and destroy it? That's my question. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm not jumping into that fire with you, but yeah, the... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it is one of the seven <laughs> elements of responsible AI. So I'm just Welcome synthesizing data. Yeah. I didn't make that pillar up. It exists. So yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I, it's, just, it's so frustrating how it's gotten out of control. You know, um, and OK, and with that, um, <laughs> yeah, about 15 minutes, we're back here at 10 after 3, and then we're out by 3.30 at the latest, OK? And we'll probably spend more time on final wrap-up questions and so forth. And, and you'll have the net, I'll show you what the principles are for the last three pieces. We won't do this discussion piece, but I would love if there are hanging questions out there or burning platforms, not that one, that, <laughs> that we want to talk about. I'd love to do that before we get out of here, okay? All right, see you in 15 minutes. Um, I thought we could just do Q&A, any burning questions. There were a couple of things that came up during the break and I'm happy to, um, share some additional information if there are no questions, but um, is there anything still, how many of you came in here very skeptical about AI? How many? And, and did any of you change your mind at all in terms of your skepticism? 
Have you moved to more of a pragmatic position? There are actually certain things you can do depending on where you're coming from. Um, When we create strategies around AI implementation, I really, like, it's not something that you can, or integration, it's not something you can just ram down everybody's throat and say, this is here now, you've got to start using this, and the kids are going to use it, and so forth. So we have to meet people where they are, and I'll, I'll find that slide. Uh, actually, it's probably a quick thing. I want to share, before we do that, though, I want to share this last piece around security and privacy, transparency and control, governance and compliance. So this is a very basic framework of the seven key elements. Um, and again, you'll have access to this. It can help shape some of the ways that you form your opinions about what can go on in your classroom, what should go on in your classroom. Obviously in alignment with what the district is saying and so forth, or the school. Um, but it's these kinds of conversations then that you can also have, and hopefully these types of questions, and I actually have a lot more of these types of questions, uh, conversation starters, et cetera, that you can have with students to have a healthy conversation about it that's a little less about did you use this and finding a way to prosecute that, right? So, um, so that's that piece. Now, I asked a question around skepticism um, so we have these human first AI strategies and in every organization there are skeptics, there's the never AIers, right, uh, which is part of the skeptic group and then there are enthusiasts who really want to get going with it, they believe in it but they don't know exactly how to use it to find value. And then there are pragmatists who aren't all that excited about it, but they can see a few ways that it can be used in a positive way. And then there are the advocates. And I would just suggest that regardless of where you are as you leave here today, I don't know if we changed hearts and minds today in the short period of time that we had, there are things that you can be doing as it relates to where you are. So for instance, if you're a skeptic, Start using the tools. Really understand what tools your students are already using and understand it from your perspective, not only so that you can uncover the risks that you know are there, but also so you can see why and how to work with the technology because it's impossible to teach AI agility and the underlying principles around agility and responsible use and forming a healthy human AI relationship or partnership, et cetera, unless you yourself have that capability or you know somebody that does that should do that work um, for you in the school. So and then enthusiasts, um, this is more about finding ways to create value that's aligned with the objectives of your student outcomes, with the goal, the objectives of the school, the objectives of the district, et cetera. So, uh, love the enthusiasm, but let's figure out ways to create value leveraging AI, individually, organizationally, in an aligned way. And then pragmatists are, that's where um, it comes down to integrating into workflows. I'm guessing most of you, most educators are, uh, are coming at this from either a skeptic or a pragmatic point of view. If you're a pragmatist right now, you should be thinking about one or two use cases where you can leverage these tools in the work streams in your classroom. I'm not suggesting you should, if, if there are policies against doing so and so forth, I'm saying for your job, not with your students necessarily. But find the workflows that are in alignment with the policies of the district, et cetera. And then with regard to champions, that's where responsible AI, you really start to hammer that because we've got to have that. And this is not necessarily chronological, it's just some people are already champions, okay? You can't be a champion until you understand how to use the product, how it integrates into workflow, how to create value. It's hard to champion without those things. 
Um, many people believe you have to start with responsible AI. I disagree. I think that's, that's a significant um, element of everything that we're doing. We're always building with that intention, but it's not the first thing that you need to learn. You can't figure out AI ethics until you learn how to leverage AI tools. It's just, that's the reality of it. So, um, and then what human skills come into play and how are we sharing and building those skills and competencies and mindsets uh, within students. So that's another framework that I, I can certainly include for you just to think through that a little bit in terms of any strategies you might have at a departmental level, a school level, a district level, and so forth. Are there any other questions that come up with five minutes to play? And That's where I am. I, um, you know, as Mario said in the intro, uh, you know, I write for different publications, and I usually do that collaboratively with the former chief learning officer at Microsoft, Abhijit Baduri, and then a guy named Greg Sattel, who's an innovation author. And Greg said to me a month ago, writing is rewriting. And so when I look at the iterative cycle of creating, co-creating with AI, that's where I think it is. There's certainly some formulaic aspects, like for the last six years, most sports stories about the game, uh, so explaining what happened in the game, much of that is written by AI engines already, right? So there are elements of writing that are automated. There are elements that are um, more likely to be augmented with AI, and there are elements of writing uh, or types of stories and so forth, columnists. They may use AI a little bit to augment their own capabilities, but generally speaking, that's the most intrinsically human element of writing in, in terms of profession. I, when I look at uh, writing legal briefs, um, creative industries, marketing, SEO language, all of that stuff, I think much of that is going to be AI generated and, and you know, ask me a year from now when GPT-5 out, is out and, you know, we saw that slide where experts in 2017 said it's decades away and then in 2023 they said, no, it's, it's here, it's coming. This is going to change again. It's going to become even tighter as new technologies come out. That video tool that you saw at the top of the event uh, that came out yesterday, it makes everything else that's out there right now look like a toy. It's able to produce a minute of video. That's its current limitation. A year from now, I would expect that people are producing short movies. Right now, at a minute, it can do every TikTok video, right? So um, it's moving. It's moving in what they're referring to as a double exponential rate. So, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for honoring me with spending the day together. I really appreciated the level of engagement. Thank you. Um, the level of engagement, the quality of the conversation, the discussion, the lack of aggressiveness from most of you. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. No, believe me, this is one of the nicer groups. Um, so I, I want to thank, thank you for the spirit with which you engage in this conversation and just know that I'm a resource. If you are on LinkedIn, I publish a lot of content on LinkedIn as a top voice in AI, and so that's a pretty good place to find that information from me. Um, and I will make whatever I shared with you today available to the district and you'll have access to that through a Dropbox link or something of that nature. Okay, thank you. Applause, thank you. Uh, I, again, I thank Mr. Todd for coming to Laredo again. He was uh, recently here on January the 8th. So I, I hope you all have a good weekend and uh, everything he talked about, including the slides, I'll be emailing them to you as soon as uh, Todd shares them with me. Appreciate it, thank you very much. Thank you.